Well, is this game trying so hard to be bad? Well, here I am. Tori the Queen. Queen of the entire land. Shocking, <laughs> I know, given my unpopularity. But how did I come to this, I hear you say. And why would I have the gall to stone myself with yet another unpopular opinion? That you would also say. Well, it's a long story. Welcome to why Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is an overrated, poorly written, dated mess. A little disclaimer, before you dislike the video or say some mean comments below, I'd like to harp on a couple things. Let me preface this video by saying that it isn't aimed to ruin your enjoyment of the game you like. Rather, it's to explain why I don't like something that everyone else loves, in this case, today, being Conqueror's Bad for a Day. It'd be really stupid of me to just randomly hate on the beloved game without any context. The reason why I made this video is because Congress Bad Fur Day is seen by many as a masterpiece that is worthy of all this clout, and I have yet to see someone who truly doesn't like it aside the Super Flipper 76, and even the very provider of this video's footage, Levin. I'm not trying to build a hate train for Conqueror, I'm just saying that I'd like to see what Conqueror's fans, and the public in general, really think of this Nintendo 64 classic. Has it aged well, both as a game and in concept? Is it still fun to play today? Is it indeed as funny and well written as it has been claimed to be? Are there things that should be changed, and does it need a sequel? Stick around to find out. So, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, one of the most well received titles of the N64 era, a game that has garnered a reputation for being funny, creative, timeless, fun, and most importantly, unique like no other. Now, I will admit that the idea of an adult 3D platformer is definitely unique as it had trouble development, a lot of voice acting, me, huh, listen here, you, listen to me, we'll get you 10%, and that's a final offer, now, 10%, yes, and a cartoony visual style incongruent with the edgy and dark tone they were going for. People would look at this and call it impressive, a true work of art. However, I believe that this is the worst game Rare has ever put out, or at least one of them. I've tried time and time again to see for myself what good it could possibly have, as people say it needs to be seen to be believed. I did just that by watching a long play, but it only made me hate it more. In Bad Fur Day, there is a massive number of juvenile adult jokes, forced nonsensical violence, no story to speak of despite the game telling me otherwise, and all the bad gross-outs that makes pig, goat, banana, cricket look tame by comparison. It's hard to talk about Conqueror's Bad Fur Day without having covered the history of its developer, Rare, as well as its problematic development I mentioned earlier, so let's go over these first. The British developer subsidiary Rare was founded in 1985 by the Stamper Brothers, who received a large sum from Nintendo to make NES games. Rare then partnered with Nintendo, who became their parent's company until 2002, when Nintendo sold them over to Microsoft the time when Rare supposedly died. The Rareware games released from Microsoft's original Xbox were seen as underwhelming and a far cry from Rare's expected quality, most notably Banjo-Kazooie Nuts and Bolts, which killed every Banjo-Kazooie fan before Smash Ultimate revived them by adding Banjo and Kazooie as a playable duo. This left the Banjo-Kazooie series feeling very niche, with a main duology over two decades old and a couple spin-off titles. Now why do I bring this up? Does this have anything to do with Conqueror's Bad Fur Day at all? Well, what if I told you that the reason why I have so much respect for Rare 
and why I feel Conker's bad for they soiled their record, is because I grew up playing the Banjo-Kazooie duology. I only have Rare to thank for the childhood memories these games gave me, particularly Banjo-Tooie, which I felt was superior to the original game in every capacity. I always want to make a video about why I feel Banjo-Tooie is a superior game when everyone else preferred Kazooie, but Cloud Connections already did that for me in his Banjo-Tooie video, which I put in the description below. Now I feel the Banjo-Kazooie duology is indicative of Rare's prime as a developer when they were helmed by Nintendo. It's no secret that Rare declined over time, especially when Nintendo lost interest in Rare after Banjo-Tooie in late 2000. However, there's something that always bugged me about Rare. Even in those games I played and loved back then on my old N64. It was only a few years ago when I realized the truth behind why my father shouted at me for saying what he thought was the F word. When I was really reading the dialogue aloud between Banjo, Kazooie, and the Anglerfish boss in Banjo Tree's fourth world, Jolly Roger's Lagoon. In answering how the Banjo Kazooie duology is related to Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, I present the sheer abundance of adult jokes, showcased in the videos on screen and in the description. This is most egregious in Banjo Tooie, where there is no shortage of adult jokes, of which, mind you, his predecessor still had. In Banjo Kazooie, when you completed the game, you can find a woman at the beach carrying a tray holding two watermelons. Where I hadn't understood what it really meant way back then, I understand it now with a little less respect for Rare. In Banjo Tooie, there is Honeybee's questionable character design, the returning Boggy with his ludicrous lines, and his wife with her awkward animations. There is a sign in Jolly Roger's building with only a slight hint of subtlety. Mr. Patch. Any anglerfish boss we mentioned before. Uh, let's just call him Lord Wu Flack Flack. Oh lord, they're not even trying to hide it. Oh, and he bleeds when you hit him! Ready to E for everyone! Yeah, I had to make that joke. Now I'm not saying adult jokes in kids' games are bad. Far from it. I just like more subtle and respectful adult themes, such as in Fire Emblem Sacred Stones, also an E-rated game, with deep messages about bonding, war, death, all conveyed with a fun and lovable cast with lots of depth. This is a true mature game that shied away from excessive violence and sexuality in delivering its messages that appeal more to adults than they do to children. This is in stark contrast to the juvenile adult humor that plagued Rare back in the day, even if they didn't utterly destroy games like this masterpiece. However, that was just the tip of the iceberg, as a man of ambition would later take the adult humor to a new level. One day, Chris Seavor, <laughs> Chris Seaver, Chris Saver. You know what? Let's just call him Chris Seaver. Like Julius Caesar, while making research for this video, I came up with a theory. A game theory, if you will. Credited in the special thanks section in Banjo Tooie's credits, Seaver most likely inspired most of the adult jokes in the game, or at least a good amount of them. Since he's listed in special thanks, we don't really know what he did, so keep in mind that what I said was just a theory. Either way, he decided to pursue his own vision of a rare game. Knowing the video game market and Nintendo's place in it as a family-friendly company, Seaver felt that it would require convincing the higher-ups at Rare, those being the Stamper Brothers at the time, to shake things up. He told them about the then-cancelled Rareware game 12 Tales, Conquer 64, and that he would consider not discarding the game's code because of an idea he had. An edgy, violent, provocative game starring a cute cartoon animal with a dark personality. In Seaver's demented mind, a premise so incongruent would definitely work in finding a cancelled project and identity as it would be revived as Conker's Bad Fur Day. The vision of one man, the vision of Chris Seaver. The Stampers were so impressed over an idea so outlandish and groundbreaking at the time that they accepted it and rewarded him with their project lead role. Seaver persisted in his creed, becoming one of the hardest working directors of any second party developer as the programmer, lead voice actor, voicing all the male characters including the protagonist, cutscene screen player, background and layout artist, and even graphic developer and writer. It's like an indie game where the writer slash brainchild would do most, if not all the work themselves, whenever someone offered to help them. To the Conquer fans, as a result, Seaver is a god amongst men. But to me, he's just an admirably persistent, demented man with great ambition. In a way, I kind of respect him, even though I'm not a fan of his work. 
Aside as voices of Slippy the Frog and Peppy the Hare from 2002 Star Fox Adventures, the final Rareware Nintendo game, he hasn't done much for Rare after he's achieved his vision, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day, instead leaving Rare in 2011 to start a new studio called Gory Instinct in 2012 where he continues to develop games, albeit with a current library of two titles. Funny enough, this on screen is his Twitter account, which got suspended, but what I assume is saying and posting a great deal of inappropriate stuff. I may be wrong here, but I'm just assuming. So after all of this background information, it's finally time to talk about the very vision of an event and developer for what it is. And yes, given it's not very long, I decided to go all in and give it a full scene by scene review using Levin's long play as footage. Yes, this is my full review of the game, where I tell you my thoughts on every little part. After all, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day must be fully seen to be believed, right? With all that said, Fetch some drink and snacks, and let's start the review. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day starts with the iconic silent red line, does normal game things, before panning to the N64 logo dancing around. Conqueror himself intervenes, destroys us with a chainsaw, and calls it stupid for seemingly no reason other than to spite Nintendo for losing interest in Rare as a subsidiary. When I first saw this as a 17 year old, the first thing I thought was, is this game trying to annoy me? Nintendo is publishing the game for you, Rare. Why insult them and their system's logo, especially when the GameCube is nearing completion? Conquer, as an original Rare property like Banjo and Kazooie, represents Rare in every way imaginable, winking to the camera. This leads to a transition of Conquer, walking drunkenly into his favorite bar, leading us into the menu screen. The text used at the top elicits familiar feelings as it is the same font used in Rare games, where we can already see Rare's specific style in action. We can even see Banjo and Kazooie in wall trophy form, celebrating Rare at its prime and Seaver appreciating a certain game he most likely wrote bad jokes for. Entering a door to start a new or saved game, Nintendo presents... Yeah, Rare was obviously making Nintendo take the blame for angry parents to ruin its reputation. No wonder Conqueror's Bad Verde was so hard to purchase that it became antique. The pre-credits claims the game stars Conquer and Barry, and already we can see a story problem. To which the Conquer fans watching this will say, and we already can see a video problem, because Conquer's Bad Verde doesn't rely much on a story at all, so you can't criticize it. Okay, if the story is not the focus, then what makes Conqueror's Bad Fur Day so good if everything else in it is so bad? The gameplay is mediocre at best and makes Banjo-Kazooie look like the greatest game ever made with the limited moveset. The jokes suck, and the story sucks, so what am I supposed to gravitate to? Since we're literally covering the entire game in this video, the only plus I have for Conqueror's Bad Fur Day compared to GK2 is that it's mercifully short, at around 6 to 10 hours. The former, if you're already good at the game's puzzles, some of which have a great deal of trial and error, which is essentially acting as a waste of time in the case of the latter, which would happen to first timers. What a garbage game. This coming from Rare is just embarrassing. Playing the Conquer card here, I'm going to judge this game however I want, even if the story isn't the focus. By stating that Barry is starring in the game, she needs to have a great deal of screen time to be considered a star in the first place, even if she dies at the near end, which does end up happening. Notice that death isn't the problem here, the problem is overall screen time. You're playing as Conquer the whole game while Barry is nowhere to be seen most of the time. So here's an easy fix. Say starring just Conquer and list Barry's name in the supporting cast list, which this game doesn't have because the only personality that gets the most screen time is the unlikable Conquer's own drunken retard. The characters are flat, which we'll get to when covering them. For now, we pan to a cutscene with an arrogant Conquer the King. Conquer the King. Which I'll admit looks impressive and definitely groundbreaking for the Nintendo 64, showing Rare's mastery of technology that even Nintendo would envy. Seaver writes and speaks awkward lines about how Conquer, in his own words, became the king of all the land. Yeah as if there were no rival kingdoms Conquer. As the camera slowly zooms out, Conquer reveals that this is the aftermath, and showcases rare fan service in the form of sentient, animated, inanimate objects with eyes. Those are everywhere in rare games, and are indicative of its iconic style. But Seaver had better ideas. He felt that Rusty Bucket Bay's ship pipe with two eyes and teeth wasn't edgy enough, even though it jump scared me when I first saw it as a kid. A living can makes no sense, but it's rare, so you can't really evolve them. 
I find it funny though, that either Seaver or Robin Beanland, the other writer for this game, as well as the composer, wrote this line, Come close, and I'll tell you. It all started yesterday. What a day that was. It's what I call a bad fur day. Opposing Seaver's screenplay decision to continuously zoom out instead of zooming in and change Conker's expression to match the line before zooming back out and closing the doors after reading the title. From the mentioned object subjects, if the player is supposed to represent the camera, then why are you leaving his throne room when Conker said only he can tell you the story? Just in a pic, but I might as well. My criticisms may come across as weak to most of you because the decisions in this game are mostly intentional. But where people would see these decisions as funny self-awareness jokes, I see these as genuine problems or nitpicks. Self-awareness is a good thing in most scenarios, but in Conquer, it ends up being too much of a good thing, making me feel that people are actually willing to encourage questionable writing. Like they want the game to be bad or something. In Conquer's Bad Fur Day, almost nothing makes sense, meaning that there is no good story to follow and all they have is this ugly 64-bit gross-out fest littered with bad jokes. I know this game is not for everyone, and it's sure not appealing to me. This was made for fans of the Nut Shack. After the title card appears, we transition to Barry dancing to what I assume would be her favorite song with a movie-like setup for his cutscene. Hey Seaver, ever considered movie making? Unless you're British Hideo Kojima or something. Oh well, he made his dream game and he's probably playing it right now on his Nintendo 64 since no one knows what the heck happened to him. Conker, in this scene, calls Barry past her answering machine to tell him he'll return late, but she ignores him because she is dancing. It's funny how Barry sounds cleaner than Conker because he's not voiced by Seaver himself, but that's just a little thing. It's interesting to note that Seaver was so passionate about this game having voice acting that he even just voiced some female characters just like he played Gruntilda in Banjo Tooie. Conker is called to another round of bar activity and he leaves saying he's feeling terrible over the hangover he wanted so badly. Just outside, he sees a guy with a slab, then vomits right in front of said person who angrily bares his teeth in response, because of course he would. Conqueror heads off to a sign, saying nasty on one side and nice on the other. The camera is trying so hard to convince you he's drunk as it switches to first person perspective. You've been taught well to try so hard, Seaver. Conqueror recalls the familiarity of the sign, wasps move out in foreshadowing a later act, and Conqueror decides to go up the bridge, for no reason. Because this game has inconsistent world building which is praised by fans of this game, it's hard to tell which path Conqueror came from as the fade in shows him being right behind the sign. We pan to who is supposedly the main antagonist of this awkward mess, the Panther King in his castle. We get a weasel presented milk to the feline freak, who drinks it in a glass and sets it aside on a table right next to him. Turns out, the table was defective with one broken leg and why the king didn't try to pick up the glass to save it when the table was slowly falling is simply a petty way to get the conflict going. As I'm probably the only person who thinks the story is stupid, everyone will defend this game by saying, um, the story being stupid is an intentional decision, so don't question it. The writing is so clever because the game points out how stupid the storyline is, making you laugh. Well, I didn't laugh at this janky cutscene with the Panther King roaring in anger over his epiphany that the table was broken. The game literally distracts you with self-awareness over its own flaws. There's no backstory to this world or to the Panther King himself. How did he become king? How does he treat the weasels beyond just being angry at them for spilled milk? Why did the real villain want revenge against him? I know you guys are probably scoffing at me, saying that I don't understand the point, that Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is not a story reliant game. However, there is a problem. Besides extra modes which ironically had the most effort put into them, the main game is clearly story driven with all those cutscenes. The game does answer how Barry is not a very good girlfriend to conquer by having her ignore her phone call, which implies the relationship is somewhat abusive. It's alright stuff, but Seaver decides to have an antagonist with a petty motive that he says I'm not meant to take seriously. Look, I'm not against more lighthearted storytelling. It's just that the reason why the story is bad is because the game can use those flaws to make fun of itself with needlessly crude jokes. This is what I call trying so hard to be bad that they even embrace that. It's like Drawn Together, which I'm surprised a lot of people hate, since it's practically the same thing as Conqueror's Bad Fur Day with only a few differences. 
They both use art styles that are incongruent with the premise of being as dark and crude as possible without much emphasis on world building, and yet drawn together weans away some people while Conker's Bad Fur Day is a universal masterpiece? I don't like either of them, but what exactly does Conquer do better than Drawn Together if, from what I'm seeing, both on the superficial level and deep level are about the same? We pan back to Conquer, who's whining about it being one of those days because he's still drunk. After a series of cutscenes, five minutes in, we finally gain control of Conquer for the first time, and we watch him slowly wobble over as we have to reach a randomly placed garden that is fenced, and Conquer is drunk so he can't jump over it, meaning we have to loop around without any options for speeding up. This isn't the game I'm playing. This is part bad movie, part bootleg rareware game. Conquer comes up to a scarecrow and asks for help in getting back home, to which the scarecrow says no before sticking on a maybe. Maybe. Conquer, despite being hungover, asks for the Scarecrow's name, leading into a surprisingly decent joke about incorrect names, which is more of an exception than anything else, as it's not trying to be vulgar, which is nice. This was added by Seaver because he's decreed that his vision will have a joke for everyone, but sadly, this is one of the few good jokes I could find. With an ear grating music track hovering around, Conquer is told to step on a pad akin to those feather and jump pads in the Banjo Kazooie duology. Birdie tells us to interact with the pads, making some unfunny jokes about contact sensitivity to keep the game as boring and unengaging as possible. I'm only giving Birdie alcohol, making him dumber than he already was. He then tells us to do it again on a different pad, just with a notable camera angle on the swearing joke in the form of a sign. I kind of chuckle over this since it caught me off guard it was pretty inoffensive compared to the rest of the garbage Seaver calls jokes. What even is going on? Just a drunk squirrel giving alcohol and helium to a scarecrow that somehow has a liver? How does Conquer even carry those things anyway? Birdie goes to sleep, and Conquer moves to the other pad to sober himself. What kind of script is this? If Conquer was complaining about feeling so bad when he was drunk, why did he drink the magic sober potion at the very beginning? Not only is Conquer a cruel and stupid character who only cares about berry and drink, so I can't relate to him whatsoever, but the things he does make no sense. Did somebody say I'm a stupid character? Oh, look, it's Conker. <laughs> Needn't you worry, I wasn't talking about you. But I heard the name Conker. I sound like you, actually. Uh, you want to hear my review of your game? Oh, yeah, uh, you mean Siva's masterpiece, Conker's Bad Fur Day? Yes, I have called him over to complete this review. He's in Europe at the moment, but either way... As you can tell, this is another cutscene where he realizes that magic pads exist, but fails to provide context behind their existence other than they're contrived to fit the narrative. Notice the wording here. Conker's admitting his game story is made to have beats occur at certain times, as it's trying to be more of a parody than a game. Perhaps that's the game's appeal, but it's not working on me, because a parody game like this will only work if it has something of value, which it doesn't, as none of the characters or story beats resonate with me. Here, for example, Conker seemed to have the potion all along, so it doesn't need a magic pad to remind him of it. It's just a stupid surprise, leading it to Conker boasting about how special Bad Fur Day's cutscenes are. Yeah, it's time we talked about that. The cutscenes are janky looking because they're 1. on Nintendo 64, again, they were groundbreaking in that era, and 2. they were animated with a program called Maya, which I don't think is a bad program. Conker points out that the cutscenes, which there is a lot of, around two and a half hours worth of content, need to be watched at least once before you can skip them, which really confirms my suspicion that Seaver really is fond of Kojima's work. The difference is Metal Gear Solid has much better cutscenes with an actual plot playing out and actual character arcs happening as opposed to this vague, vapid dumbfest by Seaver. Like this is a bad Metal Gear Solid fan game or something. I even had some gears to get a later in this adventure! You sound bad, too. I was talking about Metal Gear Solid, Conquer. Oh, it makes sense. You're boasting about doing an act of good. Boasting? <laughs> no, that's achievements. After boasting about the quality of the cutscenes, we regain control of Conquer and the game actually begins. There's not much to say about the gameplay, other than Conquer magically games arm floats when swimming, which I think is a joke that Seaver thought was funny. 
It's essentially surface only swimming, as the game literally prevents you from messing around by swimming underwater, which this game does have, but this unlocks later when it's needed with a context sensitive pad. Also, the flutter jump is a nod to Tails from Sonic the Hedgehog, which is more proof that this game is trying so hard to be a parody. After crossing gaps, we come across a gargoyle guarding the bridge. If you think you're coming this way, you can think again. Where the two talk about gothic architecture, while Conker tries to charm the charmer to get what he wants. The gargoyle is not really a character, as what you see is what you get. He's pretty tolerable though. Conker uses a frying pan in battle, mostly to stun things like the two eyes key in typical rare fashion, which reminds me of the two eyed game pack and the two eyed battery from Banjo Tui. Whamming the gargoyle, Conker makes him face of malice, where the giant stony falls off the bridge into a lake that reminds me of Spiral Mountain. Hmm, as if Banjo Tui wasn't adult enough, Seaver. Conker goes to sleep inside, then we pan over to the mad scientist weasel with a horrible voice. <laughs> Who goes over to visit the Panther King who requests him to repair the table. The professor says a line implying that the king spilled his milk because of the table, and only now did the king realize it, making an empty threat of what happened last time. The professor doesn't really have any motive to hate the king, as all the latter is doing is requesting him to fix the table. Pumo isn't being very harsh on screen, so any bad blood they may have is questionable at best. The professor throws that anti-gravity chocolate at the Conqueror for no reason, who happens to see the castle but doesn't bother because he has to get home, before he suddenly changes his mind deciding to instead become the richest creature who ever lived. Why these mercenaries went after me makes no sense in retrospect. You read my mind well. I'll give it to you. Can I drink this? Uh, no. We go to the same bridge, a nasty nice sign, where we meet the Bee Queen, crying over her missing hive which was stolen by wasps as foreshadowed earlier by Seaver. We take back the beehive only to get the wasps on our tail so that the queen can use the hive as a weapon. The Stamper brothers had initially thought it would just be a collectible, but Seaver told them that he was a god of game design, making the beehive rapidly shoot rounds of bullets, killing the wasps as a satisfactory reward. And this is resolved in nary a few seconds where this arc ends with the queen be making a cheated by her husband joke, which is not something I find funny. Conquer is revealed to be a money grubber over the queen's reward, which is living money with eyes. On that note, the queen bee is a very boring character, who always speaks in a forcefully sad tone, even when something good happens. She does care about her hive, but not because of the many eggs she's laid within, which would make you care about her. No, her main purpose is to act dumb, possess a weapon and hold it permanently in one area, and cry about her pathetic husband. Now why would bees need dollars is beyond me, but again this world only exists to serve Conqueror's wishes. Birdie pops out of nowhere to present us with a manual which I'm assuming he claims is helpful long term in this linear adventure. Now I haven't given my full thoughts on Birdie, but I think the reason why I didn't is simply because he's very one note. He's essentially a drunken idiot who can somehow tell where Conqueror is at any point, seeing how he left his post to help us progress the game for no reason whatsoever. Is he a manual seller? He didn't seem to have any back at the garden, which I'm assuming is his home. In fact, he's so dumb that when Conker gives him $10, he laughs maniacally <laughs> as if he'd made money, not noticing his prize escape him because can a scarecrow feel anything, I wonder? In that instance, unfunny sound effects play, yeah, there's no way we gotta get a lot of these, trust me, and these $10 walk back to Conker, highlighting a problem with how Seaver uses rare style. Seaver's dollar voice is awful, and being foul-mouthed and sentient, they decide to choose Conqueror as their master for no reason. Yeah, this game makes so much sense, guys. Seaver is trying to make this game like Banjo-Kazooie, which is an adventure that has magic pads to do with special abilities that cannot be performed manually, such as the slinging catapult here. I think the catapult could easily be mapped to the N64 controller, since you use it quite frequently. The only reason why it was limited to context-sensitive pads is to restrain the player's freedom, which is only a bad thing. The Beatles who appeared in an earlier cutscene seemed to hate Conker for no reason, maybe because they somehow knew he would try to kill them. 
Upon being attacked in game, however, only the beetle who got hit approaches you instead of the whole troop, which contradicts the cutscene. I get the reason why, it is definitely to make the game easier, and I'm well aware that Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is known for being difficult. There are two paths to take, one of which leads into a mountain of muck, where Conqueror must put on a gas mask because of the smell. How many things can Conqueror carry? Beats me. The door is locked, until 10 o'clock for no reason, other than to prevent a sequence break. And Conquer decides to go the other way, triggering a cutscene with the professor who formulates an experiment to fix the table and glass. Like again, why does the professor hate the king so much? What are his motives for using the teddies? That we'll never know. We can see that this game is indeed story driven, which as I said before is pointless since the story sucks and it's just a bunch of random events strung together instead of an actual cohesive narrative. We visit Thwomp Village. Meet a Thwomp Thwomp named Jack who requests us to get the unnamed giantess Thwomp off of him. Conker cries about helping people, but because this game has no story, he's forced to help Jack in the end, who suggests visiting his friend Bart. Taking a few seconds to discuss the characters, Jack is an NPC, who's somewhat helpful, even rewarding you for helping him. The Crusher, however, doesn't say anything, and she's only a platform who somehow jumped atop Jack for no reason and is therefore not even a character. The thwomps in the area are shown to move and stomp, so why doesn't she jump off Jack? Is it because she hates him? Jack doesn't even say her name, so we're not sure of anything really. Here's where the visual spectacle comes into play. We meet a creepy mouse with a knack for being annoying by killing my ears with those horrible sound effects, although he doesn't mean any harm. There's nothing else to say about him other than he loves cheese. Go watch Mr. Bean, Mr. Beanland. We get the mouse some cheese from Bart's place, and he wants some more. Marvelous! One more should just about do it! So we repeat the same busy work twice, just to gross out the female thwomp to get her off Jack. How so you ask? Let's talk about that. Okay wise guy, why do you have to add countless incongruous flatulence jokes to this mouse? Every time he's on screen, you hear the stupid sound that makes me angry. Seriously. Why do people associate that sound with, oh, it's so funny, when the response you're supposed to get is pure disgust? The mouse, with each second of screen time he gets, makes me wish I muted the screen, and it persists as you get him cheese, which blows him up for, yes, more gut grating gassiness. The third one, however, triggers a cutscene where he claims he's had too much, inflates nonsensically, and literally explodes, with flesh and blood flying everywhere. Which actually gave me a sigh of relief, seeing that he died as to not make any more stupid noises. Right? Really, Seaver? You built up this annoying character who was supposed to have a satisfying, albeit unnerving death at the same time, just to ruin it with another pathetic flatulence joke? From a tail and bone, no less? How is this possible? It's my world check. Deal with it. This only made me cringe as Conquer went into the bar to meet a bunch of harmless haystacks. Sentient rare tools, watch as they banter over who's going to kick Conquer and fitting as many unfunny swear jokes as they could. The brush and paint can are literally not given names in this act, despite getting more screen time than Barry, the supposed coal star of this game. The victim friend they bully, a pitchfork named Frankie, decides to attack Conker on their behalf and ends up killing innocent haystacks who are just jumping around. It's not like in Banjo 2 where getting locked up has actual story consequences. A good example is Mingi Jongo, who was sent by Grunty and her sisters to kill you in a fake mumble skull. I was at least able to take him and his battle seriously even today. Here, everything's so random. Frankie hangs himself, but doesn't die because he has no esophagus since he's a literal pitchfork, leaving and Conquer to free him later in the game. A giant haystack with arms intervenes to just walk around aimlessly. Time to wander around. Aimlessly. Boof. Boof. Saver, please, stop a minute, there's no tension. Actually, it's genius writing. The aimless walking at me lo look for something more interesting. I also haven't drunk this booze yet. Well, before you do, I suggest you answer me this. Why did you enter the barn and why did you leave it? Was it for money? Yeah. As if that wasn't bad enough, 
the king bee who fell out of the barn window earlier talks about the woman of his dreams and misshapen giant flower. She is cute. Shut up, Conker. What's stupid is that one, flowers just don't look like that, Seaver. Two, the bees are idiots. King Bee wants to pollinate the flower, but that's a metaphor for something far more egregious. How did Queen Bee know her husband cheated on her? Like, this game is just trying its best to make me raise an eyebrow, but not for how good it is. The flower is simply an excuse for more retarded jokes as she hides her imperfections and jokes about Conqueror's tail being hairy, implying that she's not even referring to his tail. Yes, I do get the joke. It just isn't funny. I couldn't believe that someone actually came up with a stupid idea, and it hasn't been done again since, and I can see why. And without her consent, Conqueror decides to tickle her with bees. Once she gets tickled enough, King Bee intervenes to pollinate her, where she can then be used as a provocative platform to receive some cash stashed atop a platform. In this cutscene, Seaver thankfully had the decency to not show what was obviously in his mind at that point, but the sounds and Conqueror's expression are more than enough proof that this is a bed of soil. Ugh, what a concept, Seaver. Aside from being used to reach a ledge with money on it, there's literally no way how this plot thread can advance the story. So what's the point? King Bee and the Flower are some of the worst characters in this game, because they only exist to tell horrible jokes. Where Queen Bee was boring, she was at least inoffensive. But King Bee is just a flirtatious and perverted idiot who the game treats like a big deal for in some reason. He cries about being mistreated outside of his kingdom, but the reason why he left it is because he either heard of this thing, or because he wanted to find something lovelier than his wife, both of which are stupid reasons. Worse is how nobody actually hurts or mistreats him in-game. If anything, quite the opposite. There are a lot of bees in the area, implying they followed him either to get him back to the bee kingdom on his wife's behalf, or because they were just there to support him. Honestly though, I can only see the latter making sense, since they literally opened his date up for pollination. In other words, King Bees received nothing but the loyalty treatment, contradicting his opening rant. Like, there aren't any bees near Queen Bee, and she doesn't say anything about where they went, so maybe she was betrayed by the entire kingdom, including her husband? Meanwhile, the flower is literally devoid of any personality outside being an object for King Bee. That's it. She turns down Conquer because she doesn't want him to indulge in her, and never really talks to King Bee. Instead, she just lets him do whatever he wants with her. What a pathetic pair of punchable punks! I also hate how Louis Ridgway, the voice of Barry and most of the other female characters, tries her hardest to make her sound as hot as possible. Ooh, that big tail of yours is far too tickly. <laughs> no, no, you don't understand. Hey. Get that big, long, hairy tail away from me. <laughs> I'll suit yourself, man. Mm hmm, be like that. Which means that yes, her voice sucks too. At least Barry's tone of voice doesn't gross me out. On to more important things. Conker goes inside the barn again so we can free the hanged pitfork. Why Conker decides to do that is beyond me, other than maybe he wants to exploit the pitchfork to kill the haystack. For what purpose? What would Conker gain from doing any of that if he doesn't know a thing or ask questions? This game paints Conker as a perfect, all-knowing character. More on that later. The paint can and brush become harsh friends again, only for the armed haystack to be revealed as a robot, making references along the way such as mech vision. Which is fine, but um, they feel kind of forced. The problem, however, is, why is the robot even here? Has it been sent by the evil professor to hunt down Conquer or what? The game never answers any of these questions. It's just an obstacle that serves no purpose in the story because the robot gives hints that's after Conquer, but the reason it targets him is never elaborated on. We repair the pitchfork and escape from the drain vault. Though how did the pitchfork escape the scene if Conquer only had one way out as evident by the diagram on screen? After money grubbing and turning it to an anvil compared to the more reality ground high jump and flying pad from the games that inspired this mess, Conquer heads back to the mud mountain to trigger a cutscene because I'm assuming it's now 10 o'clock. Before you talk about that, can I tell you how cool it is to turn an anvil? You use a context sensitive pad, then jump forward and fall on top of things. Ah, so that's where anvils come from. The villains are very dumb in this game, or at least the main threat is pretending to be dumb, most likely in an attempt to be funny. 
However, along with Seaver's awkward line delivery, the writing is so childish and pathetic that it only scratched my head in confusion, as I failed to see what about, what about that scene even worked. It's not as funny as it's trying to be, in fact, I didn't even chuckle, I just cringed over how try-hard it felt. And worst of all, it makes no sense. The professor is trying to use a squirrel as a table leg, but how would that even work? The professor doesn't really seem to be an idiot, so does he really think a squirrel would hold up the table instead of chew more of the table off because a squirrel is a rodent? With constantly growing teeth? And about the gap, how did the table lose the wooden piece in the first place? Also, how did the king not question the implications for as why a squirrel is even needed? He just blindly follows along with the professor's dubious dribble and sends the troops after Conquer. We pan back to Conquer, who enters the building in front of him without reason since all he will be doing for the next couple of minutes, is talking to an angry dung beetle who's just angry and that's it, then getting a cow to excrete before he kills it with an old laid bull for no reason, just to be a dumb beetle himself. Conquer delivers it, I can't get myself to say it, to the dung beetle who requested him to do it. For what? If his goal is, is to go home and be around Barry, then why is he doing all those nonsensical things if we're not shown his motive for doing them? Seaver really does have a mind of his own. After the torture fest of the last act, we come across a couple catfish who are offering Conquer cash. They are taking out the dogfish, best known for the Jaws reference. We meet a cog who switches personalities, and I can see the strain on Conquer's throat as he voices both personalities with, with distinct voices. I like Cleaver's calmer cog persona voice a little more, as a superior line delivery and more mature dialogue. Would you be prepared to do me a small favor? Might have been his practice for a later rare game with much better line delivery from overall from Slippy and Peppy, both voiced by the man himself. The Cog's other personality is a grating, generic rude. I guess this is the closest to a two-dimensional character we can never get since he literally has two one-dimensional personas. The Cog wants to reunite with three female Cogs to power the machine to, to pull back the dogfish who not understandably hate him because there's no background given to these cogs whose sole purpose is to power the safe. They essentially take the harassment joke a bit too far and distastefully that I don't even care about these characters. I honestly, we just made the characters completely unlikable. Are you implying you're not unpleasant enough? These tasks are filler and have nothing to do with Conquer, who doesn't develop over the course of any of these quests, whose characters don't have much to them to begin with. What a pointless game. Why does Conquer even swim in an underwater factory, almost drowning, just to raise after money that tosses itself into the watery abyss? Seaver is trying so hard to make the eyed money packs annoying. Speaking of annoying, these fire tricksters are all about fiery flatulence, drinking, and smoking. They dart off only for Conquer to go drunk again, why in this context assuming that Conquer is after money and is inside a factory? Oh, never mind, because this next scene, I won't even show it. I won't even show it. They literally had Conquer water down the fire fools, and for those who know what I'm talking about, you can tell I don't like any of this. Ugh, what kind of man are you, Seaver? Then we move to the second boss fight, a fire fool control machine where, after stunning said machine with sewage that had no reason to be there save for more excrement jokes I guess, you literally smash it in peculiar places. Unlike the first Haybot battle, which was at least harmless when you and Frankie worked together to hit it in the back. Now you might think is the purpose for this battle was the big big guy, but no, neither battle has a purpose in this narrative. The hate bot was literally wandering around aimlessly accomplishing nothing out of the ordinary, and the big big guy, what a stupid name by the way, is just a machine used to boost the fire fool's egos. It's true the imps fight Conquer in the factory, so they would want to ward him off, but why go full circle on its underside? It's so stupid. But looks like Seaver has heard me because after getting the money from the factory upon defeating this callous contraption, the catfish were evil all along as they ran off from the dogfish, whose rope breaks. Jeez, everyone is a money grubber here, and everyone knows they like the duel. Here's a scene from Levin's long play that wasn't too bad. It's the Jaws reference. <laughs> Uh, maybe 
I should have called that thing a Sharg. In the next gameplay segment, we search for money by literally rolling balls of excrement up a mountain with a snowball effect. Now, part of me wanted to not to discuss pointless gameplay, but I wanted to get this out of the way. Why is Seaver so obsessed with manure? It's like he visits barns, stables, pig sties, and chicken coops just to smell them and ball up the odors in labeled glass bottles to show to his friends, if he even has any. I'm serious. The amount of toilet humor this game boasts of is nothing short of abundant as it is atrocious. You can't go a few minutes without a stupid flatulence or manure joke, such as the bomb mouse making stupid noises for no reason, the fire fool on the right of the scene excreting fire, and a literal mountain of muck. I'm feeling uncomfortable just reviewing this game. I don't get the appeal behind Gross Out. It's disgusting, try hard, and especially unfunny. Seriously, what demented idiot would find something so discardable funny? It's maddening. Speaking of muck, after talking to a beetle who lost his friend, we reached the iconic Great Mighty Garbage, I can't get myself to get the name because it's stupid and childish, the Great Mighty Monster. Interestingly, is the only male character to not be voiced by Seaver, hence why his voice is cleaner and crisper. Despite singing one of the trashiest songs I've ever heard in a video game. Now granted, there's probably worse songs out there. A huge supply of tish comes from my chocolate starfish. But the song is still bad, as Seaver literally put in as many swears and bad jokes he could make into a song with the help of Beanland. Why does a monster like this exist? How did Conker know that the monster liked sweet corn? If Conker is being nice to said monster by handing him the corn, why does the monster want to destroy Conker? It really is stupid, given that yes, I don't like Conker, but he isn't doing anything particularly wrong here. Is it because he's not made of excrement? Why is there a whole mountain made of this stuff? Does Conker only defeat the monster to get some money hidden over there, as directed by the beetle? How did the money end up inside the last place you'd expect to find it? Is Conker a moolah magnet? How did the beetle know that money was all Conker cared about before Conker told anything? The battle, which is basically a musical moderato, That progresses to, into an allegro as we damage the monster by literally throwing toilet paper inside his mouth to flush him, which makes no sense given the following questions. How and why would there be paper rolls inside a place where they won't do much, since they'd be wet and therefore unusable? Who put them there for Conquer to use against the monster? Also, is the mountain supposed to be a rectum of some sort? I mean, what triggered the mountain's flushing mechanic to end this monster's life? This game really wants me to flush it down the toilet. But since I just endured endless suffering for the past couple of minutes, let's just change the tone for a bit to talk about the game overs, which are actually the best parts, if not the only good ones, in this big sack of garbage. What's nice about this is that Seaver himself wanted to show how game overs and lives worked, in a way where the stupid quote unquote humor is toned down a peg, making the scene not only tolerable but enjoyable. Said scene starts with Conqueror lying dead in what appears to be a dungeon, and the Grim Reaper calls out to him in a scary voice. Conqueror wakes up just to hear the voice fluctuate as it's revealed the Reaper was actually pretending to be scary the whole time using a voice-changing microphone. I was actually caught off guard when it was revealed that he is short and has a squeaky voice. After introducing himself as Greg, Conqueror asks questions over whether he's alive or dead. Greg, on the other hand, nonchalantly makes deals with Conqueror, who doesn't care otherwise, and even stopping him dead in his tracks, which is actually funny. But not quite. Oh, right. Well, uh, I'll be off then. Just you wait, smart ass. You don't get out of it that easily. Greg doesn't express any negative sentiments to Conquer, despite him having many chances. Yeah. Since squirrels in real life are some of the fastest mammals around. He detests cats because they have nine lives, and even when I looked this game up at 17 years old, I still remember Greg fondly. He adds charm to a game that's practically devoid of it, and it's a shame he only appears when you die. And that's one other moment when he's gone fishing. 
Now I'm going to mention GK2 for a second here, since I honestly really like Greg the Grim Reaper in Conqueror's Bad Fur Day as a game over character. He isn't that compelling, because since when the Conqueror's Bad Fur Day have good characters, but he is the best character in the game, as he has the best lines of dialogue and feels less one-dimensional than the other characters. Now I brought up GK2, aka Ace Attorney Investigations 2, because in that game, when you lost all your health, you were given a pathetic game over that is so unbelievably bad it can't even count as a game over. Rather, it's an empty insult, disincentivizing you from losing at all. When even Conquer gets the game over right, you know something's messed up. Where Yamazaki chickened out and chose a lazy game over just to save time for his convoluted story, Seifer actually takes the time to make a really interesting series of exchanges between Conquer, a sinner, and a Grim Reaper with surprisingly fun lines to listen to, making the whole ordeal better written than the rest of the game. If I were to play this game for myself, I'd find every way to die just to see it. Even the skeletal hand reviving Conquer is charming, as it drops Conquer back into his world before disappearing. The best way to describe this moment is a gold coin inside a dumpster. Would that be a man of sh It's where much of the garbage is at, especially because music track plays those stupid sounds for no reason. Jeez, my new girlfriend. Sure, bad tastes. Well, as if very way different. Who said we were dating, ingrate? It's worth noting that the game over changes depending on whatever part of the game you're in, with different cutscenes pertaining to how you die. Another reason why I mentioned GK2, because in that game, you're stuck to the same pathetic game over throughout the whole game, whereas in Conquer, Seaver at least had the decency to do what the first Ace Attorney Investigations did, only that game crushes CBFD in every way. If you die in the first chapter, you will pan over to the Panther King quietly enjoying his cup of milk, where the camera will zoom out to reveal the milk carton sporting Conquer's face on it. However, I'd like to ask, is this milk carton sitting on the King's table? If it is, then if it's not tipping the table, does that mean the table still has its leg on? This just wants me to know how it got cut off in the first place even more. Once the main story starts off, dying in a normal manner will result in Conquer getting captured, tied up, and being placed under the table itself, as suggested by the evil professor. Hmm, turns out it actually works. The guards say they won't be getting the duct tape. Which means what exactly? Is this what makes him resent the ruler? That being them potentially facing the same fate of Scrat in Ice Age 3 in this scene? When Conquer drowns to death, the weasel guards present his bagged, soggy body, and they express fear over the sound of invisible tape, while Pumo sits there menacingly. I'm pretty sure Seaver could have shown something like that happening, but frankly, I am actually pleased that he used the sound effect as a duct tape to show it actually is there, unlike GK2. When Conquer is decapitated, the guards deliver his part to the king, who laughs maniacally. I'm not sure why, but Pumo either loves gore, or he's just laughing over how incompetent his guards are. Now, as evident by the cutscene that did show Conquer holding the table up, his body needs to be intact and alive. A corpse will just droop over, and decapitated body parts will just spread out. So, Pumo gains nothing from either offering. So where the drowning aftermath sequence actually works because Pumo is threatening to punish the weasels for the disappointing find, the one where Conquer got gored is... weird. The last variation is when Conquer gets incinerated, where Pumo and the guards will laugh together, as if they're all in good terms, which kind of contradicts the other variations, where the weasel guards were clearly afraid of Pumo. I've read some TV tropes that there's yet another alternative ending when the Panther King is no more, but I obviously don't have any footage for it, so we'll just leave it at that. Overall, it is nice to have multiple game overs, especially for a 2001 platformer. Now back to adventure! After receiving the money from where we defeated the Muck Monster, we pan to Barry dancing again just to have her door getting knocked, where she complains about Conqueror's excuses, which again highlights how this game can't decide whether it wants to be nonsensical or have a bad story because the context for why Barry is so annoyed of Conquer is never provided. Let me stress again that Barry being proclaimed a co-star is misleading, since this scene is literally a parody to the damsel in distress trope, but with a misogynistic take this time around, where women don't appreciate men, only for the women to appear dumb, because those same men they hate are the only ones who can rescue them. Oh yeah, I said damsel in distress, meaning that the Rocky guy kidnaps Barry for apparently no reason, 
how he knew her home's location is beyond me, not to mention no discernible map exists for this demented world. So we have no sense of place, and as a result, this kidnapping just feels forced. Galio's brother has no on-screen motive to kidnap Barry, unless whoever sent this golem wanted her for a yet unknown reason. Also, remember what I said about Barry's limited screen time at the beginning of the review? She's marketed as a star, a key player in the game, so much so that she even appears on the box art. But the game is ultimately lying to you about her importance, as she literally gets kidnapped for no reason other than to reduce her screen time. Hey genius, if you're going to do that to Barry, a character I don't even like, at least don't market her in the game's pre-credits and on the box art. You may argue that people didn't care about video game characters back then as much as they do now, but even older box art have consistent character representation. Super Mario 64 didn't have Peach on the cover because she was kidnapped by Bowser. Super Mario RPG for the SNES had Peach on the cover because she becomes a playable character who does the single most important thing for your party, that being the ability to heal. Even other rare games have less misleading box arts. Just looking at Banjo-Kazooie's box art literally tells you it's going to be a collectathon starring a bear and bird duo being chased by a green witch. Mumbo's small relative size indicates he will become a supporting character. The Jinjo sitting comfortably in Banjo's hand implies that you, as Banjo, will do some rescuing, which ties in nicely with the story of rescuing Tootie who isn't in a box art for the same reason as Princess Peach in Super Mario 64. Donkey Kong 64 showcased the Donkey Kong group in his box art, as each character is essential to completing the game. Oh yeah, let's push it further by talking about Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Kong Quest, on the SNES. We can see Diddy and Dixie while Donkey Kong is absent, which means that this is not Donkey Kong's game. If we follow the same logic of kidnapped loved one who needs rescuing, Barry is the odd one out. I'm not going to say that Seaver was trying to deceive people about Barry's role, but there's a chance it was intentional. If not, then Seaver's probably more incompetent than we think. You're saying you overlooked my girlfriend indefinitely? No, I just think he wanted to make her a Princess Peach with a few tiny twists. Honestly, I'm sure I was drunk when designing the box art. Hold on, you caused these inconsistencies? Yeah! We head back inside the Muck Mountain only to find a pit of sewage, in which Conquer decides to swim in, again, for no reason. I may sound like a broken record at this point, but why would Conquer even do that? Before we continue, I'd like to briefly talk about the swimming real quick, something I could have done in the Underwater Factory Act. Whilst underwater, on the right hand side, you can see Conquer's creepy looking face which changes expression based on how long he's been underwater without taking air. In other words, his air meter. Rare is quite an expert in underwater sections with how engaging they are compared to other platformers with swimming. I mean, we already know how horrendous Mario Waller levels are. As an example, in Banjo Tui, Jolly Rogers Lagoon stands as one of the most fun water levels I've ever played. Complete with faster swimming and underwater combat, a direct improvement over Banjo Kazooie's third world, Clanker's Cavern. There, the best mechanic manifested as the fish named Gloop who would periodically blow out bubbles to refresh your air meter in the level's deepest underwater section. Speaking of Clanker's Cavern, the sewer set piece from CBFD seems to be a mesh of recycling Gloop's gimmick of air meter refreshments with Banjo Tui's underwater chopping fan set piece. This for some reason takes us to a lo lo <laughs> <laughs> This for some reason takes us to a lava area which as a transition makes no sense because just think, sewer to prehistoric lava area. And it's creative, I'll give it that, but again it makes no sense because why would a sewer be dug that deep underground? We come across the not squirrel but elephant joke with the two weasel guards who were apparently sent there by the king himself. I am not a squirrel. I'm an elephant. Like the birdy beardy pun at the beginning of the game, I'll admit that Conker saying he's an elephant using dumb description details got a chuckle out of me. When compared and contrasted, squirrels and elephants are opposites in every way, so ultimately the weasel guards couldn't even trust the description they were given just because they had no idea what an elephant was. How Kong knew they were after him is beyond me though. I should have used my tail as the elephant's trunk. Can that even work? Well, uh, he fell for it. What I didn't fall for was the forced flatulence and defecation that ruined the mood. 
It's like Seaver is trying to ruin as many jokes as possible using this garbage as a distraction. I do like the you may pass moment, followed by the you idiot, what are you doing letting it into our territory? Conker repeats the same thing he did to Birdie in his last appearance, calling the money back, this time a thousand dollars, from the other party's pocket. We enter a set piece that is very reminiscent of the Hailfire Peaks Tower from Banjo Tooie, complete with a pool of lava underneath. Tyrannosaurus run around protecting the Primo statue, indicating that this is the Panther King's territory. Again, what relevance does this place have in the story? We ground pound the statue only to kill a caveman guard, yet more Banjo Tooie Pterodactylan inspiration. We solve a puzzle where we must roll a boulder down the chasm where the guards are at while avoiding puking rock monsters resembling Barry's kidnapper. Now, I have no idea why Steve tried to gross me out using those golems, but the gameplay strikes me as kind of boring, since you can't really beat those monsters most of the time. Conker requests their music to change, in a scene that I actually quite like. Here, let me show you. <laughs> Hey, Maestro, don't you think that's a little bit too dramatic? Can you give me something with a bit more of a beat? Yeah, that's better. We get this famous song that sounds like a drunk person was singing it, and after giving it a listen, I think it's really good. Now, I like that Seaver finally allows you to mess with the praying cavemen with the context-sensitive slingshot pad. It's not much, but it's something. After some failed slingshots and realization, progression can be achieved by moving into this place with a bubble gloop swamp upper bridge over lava instead of swamp water, with cavemen along the path and a huge egg at the end. I'll admit that if there's anything people like about this game, this part is most likely one of them. It's not forcing in pathetic jokes, rather it's just casually stealing from the Banjo-Kazooie duology without being overtly offensive. Of course, some of the later parts of this game, including later in this act, will completely destroy this part's integrity, so let's lift our spirits for the time being. The most peculiar part of this act is obviously the egg, which Conker can sit on top of the hatch. Again, taken from Banjo-Tooie's hatch move, exclusive only to Kazooie in that game. Yeah, Seaver was most likely inspired by Terry Dactyland, and it shows. Right, I'm a dinosaur's mummy. You like his baby noises? Not a fan, but I admire the whimsical energy behind it. That's the game trying to be its own thing without petty pandering amidst the acceptable I'm your mommy references. Wish I got bored of pretty quickly. Also, it's mommy, not mommy. Hey, look, <laughs> I'm not British. Conquer lures the dinosaur, which is a chore since it's very slow meaning you'll often have to run back and forth and check on it to make sure it's even moving at all. Its main purpose is to eat the caveman, making sure blood spills out of its mouth gratuitously. For the most part, pretty inoffensive stuff as I typically don't mind blood. Of course, this next act caught me off guard, and not in a good way. This baby dinosaur was being used by Conker for a puzzle used to get killed in the end by squishing it. Like the mouse bomb scene, it relishes the blood splattering around the environment. Like, it would be one thing if this dinosaur were excessively annoying like Marvin was, but besides the questionable voice lines, there's really nothing wrong with the baby dinosaur. Okay, let me be serious with you, Conker. Why did you kill an innocent baby dinosaur? It's not like Mario from Super Mario Galaxy 1 and 2 was any different. You make a good point, and these games got away with it while it's rated E. But here's the thing. Mario killed these innocent babies for Power Stars, the items he needs to reach Bowser to save Princess Peach. In addition, the baby dinosaurs had the potential to kill you as they tried to defend themselves, most notably fiery Dino Piranha, who's arguably the hardest boss in the galaxy duology. Mario not only risks his life, but he also has a motive. But you? What did you gain from killing the baby dinosaur trying to help you because you're its mummy? Other than shock value. Uh. I don't really know, but I had a princess peach in the saving too. You're such an idiot. How would you know Barry's gone missing when you don't even bring her up for most of the adventure? Also, in getting home if that's your goal, you didn't need to go to the sweltering underground lava cave at all. Much like my recording room. And there's certainly no need whatsoever to kill a baby dinosaur. 
but were you praising the underground lava cave part? Well, in typical Conquer fashion, your game ruined it for me with that demented scene of killing a baby. Think about how its poor mother feels! Even some of the fans agree that it's a bit too excessive. Moving past an unfortunate casualty, the statue at the center says something along the lines of... I am pleased with your offering. And opens up just to reveal the same guy with the slab from the very beginning of the game. The same guy who Conquer annoyed by throwing up right next to him. What's he doing here? He's just chanting gibberish and launching Conquer off a stone slab without recognizing him in any way. Or here's a better question, what was he doing near the bar at the start of the game? Did he need spirits to reach out to the spiritual world? Never answered because this game is dumb. As for the Sora statue, we can see he's got a lot of green stuff inside it. I'm assuming it's the game trying to ghost me out again, but I don't really care. We annoyed gibberish Gabby to climb up the statue, peppering the nostrils to get it to sneeze the gunk out, making the inside palatable, if you will. Conker goes inside to reveal Seaver's obsession with green uvulas as we jump over gaps just to find the sleeping caveman leaving behind his hat. Or is he dead? Who cares? Conker gets back to where the religious cavemen were at, just to get them on his side because of his saber-toothed cat hat which he stole, as he requests them to kill the puking golems. Now why would Conker know it's the golems he must worry about? Is it because of that big guard at the door? Like, why? He just deduces that the cavemen are at war with the golems and literally exploits them after luring a baby dinosaur to them which gets them, guess what? Eaten! We're literally playing as a hypocritical sadist. We backtrack to where the golems were, luring the cavemen in the same way we lured the baby dinosaur. Yes, there's more of that. Worse, this time you need to make sure all the prehistoric preschoolers chase after their drunk teacher, so if you miss any like Levin did in his playthrough, you must go back to where the missing cavemen were at, and all four must be grouped together in order to destroy the golems. After we kill the golem minions, the big one, who sounds almost exactly like Birdie, yeah, Siva totally has the widest voice range of any man, requests the password after losing his brethren. Don't you think he just spawned with a battle for revenge instead of having witnessed the homicides without doing anything? Um, Conquer boasts about being the king, but obviously the big golem isn't impressed with a very obvious fourth wall joke that isn't funny due to how obvious it is. He lets us in after we give him a gibberish password that is probably yet another reference that I don't care about. In the next scene, we see Barry dancing again, this time in the cage. It's the first time we ever get to see her in a non-cutscene. And I have a lot to say about this act, trust me. Let's first start out with Barry not expressing annoyance about being confined in a cage, despite the fact that she should. It's true she's dancing to disco music, which she loves, but I think she would say something like this. Why did that stupid golem even capture me? Oh well, at least I got some dope music to dance to. We'll get to her capture after I break down this act's less interesting parts. The golems are dancing with their creepy female counterparts, but only the males interact in any meaningful way. There's an alcohol tube, which means, you guessed it, raunchily rolling the golems down into holes used to break Barry's barrier. It really shouldn't be possible because... Um, shouldn't watering rocks just, like, leave them in place? How can watering them possibly move them around? Then for once I'll say I really agree with Conker here. Why did Barry run off without saying anything as Conker calls out to her? You may say as to not gather the golem's attention. But here's a problem. The golems can clearly see Barry running away. So if they kidnapped her in the first place, why did they react by getting her back? The disco didn't need her dance moves to function, so why the kidnapping in the first place? Well, it turns out the Master Guard Golem is connected to a villain, Don Weezo, a Mafia leader. How Weezo took control of the Golems is out of the question, but another problem is Weezo himself. Barry somehow runs to him, which implies he was the one who ordered the kidnapping. 
So then you're saying, well now you know why the golem kidnapped Barry. He was working for Don Weasel. Okay, so first of all, how did Don Weasel know where Barry was, and why did he want her? Was he spying on Barry? Spying on Conker? Did Weasel plan to use Barry to lure Conker in to take his jobs? How did he know Barry was connected to Conker as his girlfriend if the Weasel Professor, who I'm assuming is his master, requested any red squirrel, without specifying? Um, I know the Professor hates squirrels, but why Conker specifically? Is Conker the only red squirrel around now? Pretty sure there are more red squirrels around. The Doc might have used Barry, since she's a squirrel, but she's huge, so I guess the Professor somehow knew that Conker wasn't the same height as Barry. Also, about Conker, how did he know the golems kidnapped Barry? This game has so many questions that are never answered, which would be fine if it was just a whimsical adventure like in a dinosaur-themed world, where such questions wouldn't even arise in the first place. I didn't ask myself that many questions in the previous act, because it wasn't that connected to the story until we transitioned out of it. Well, here we are with Don Weasel, who bids Barry leave after she served her purpose, that being luring Conker here. Where does Barry go? Back home? I don't know, the game treats it as a non-issue. Because Weasel killing one of his sus comrades with a baseball bat is the real issue. Weasel, who only seems to care about making deals with random people and angrily punishing whoever disappoint him, then requests Conker to change sides with the caveman again as he bombs their place for seemingly no reason. Weasel claims it's because they're incongruent with the world because they're prehistoric. But that didn't work on me, as it makes the game look like a mess. Conker's Bad Fur Day is the kind of game that does whatever it wants to advance the story, and I honestly don't see how destroying the lava cave will even progress that story in any way. I find it odd that the cavemen were shocked over the bomb that got Conker to decimate them in the first place, which takes away any emotional investment you may have had for them in the lava cave act. You spent time using a dinosaur baby to eat the primitive preschoolers, manipulate them into fighting the golems, who may have sided with Weasel to get the better of the cavemen, but that's never explored in the game trying to turn their brain off, but somehow make you take the story seriously with how bad it is. Like, Bad Verde really wants to have it both ways, it's a total mess. The lava rises so that Conker can conveniently have an escape route. How do these rocks appear? Well, this game even fails at subtext too. What a masterpiece. I know I'm nitpicking over something very petty, but it's a genuine question. If Conker can't go back from whence he came, as shown by this diagram trying to interpret Conker's world, then where did the rocks come from? Did they fall from the ceiling? Did they float here from broken parts of the statue? Who cares, says Seaver. Checking in on Conker himself, he... Uh, fell asleep. Yes! Outside, we see the cavemen from inside Disco appear out of nowhere, stealing Conker's money and getting away with it. When Conker wakes up, we pan over to the cavemen taunting him with the money in their hand. <sighs> More questions. These cavemen, are they rogue to the others who you destroyed? The golems don't seem to mind them when they were hanging about in Disco, and the other cavemen are their enemy, right? How do these guys feel towards their people? Background questions out now. How did they get here from the disco? Assuming Conker took the bomb to their former homeland before they left the disco, that renders them stuck and unable to leave. Second scenario, when Don Weasel interrogated Conker, these idiots left the disco off screen, and without any input, decided to wait for Conker to show up. Why steal Conker's money? If they're prehistoric preschoolers, is money valuable to them at all? You may try telling me I'm taking the game's story too seriously, but what I'm saying is, it makes no sense. Then you may try telling me it's supposed not to make sense, as even the game announces them for us. Again, acknowledging your stupidities without properly addressing them does not change the fact they're there. It's this game's nonsensical stories driving me nuts. Oh, and we're not done of course. The callous cavemen even have hoverboards, which are incongruent with their timeline. Maybe that's what Don Weasel was referring to the whole time? You might call this assimilation because they know how to use the futuristic hoverboards, but they still wear loincloth so as to taunt you in this malicious manner. That's not funny, Seaver. 
You might even come up with a rock nut tribe from Banjo Tooie, with the gimmick being to use clockwork bomb eggs to blow up their exposed rear ends. <sighs> Continuing, one of the cavemen falls off his hoverboard, leaving the rest of the party to race his conquer so that he can get his money back. I don't know why they decided to do this. If they're trying to steal the money and run, why did they just do that? Instead, Conquer just kills them all while lava surfing and steals the money their leader decided to distribute to them off screen. Riding through dinosaurs and lava caves, we crash into a gladiator arena with Oh no! A proud giant creep with an obsession for bones and his creepily deformed lady notice Conquer and decide to start an event. Conquer initially thinks about leaving the arena alongside the caveman he betrayed in the previous act, but of course is met with a surprise once the door opens. Seaver, do you have any idea what you're doing? The game feels more like a checklist of what Seaver wants to implement in his game rather than having a sense of narrative cohesion. First we raise time in the lava cave, progress the story by encountering Don Weasel, then hand wave it just for this stupid excuse of an arena. Where did the hoverboard go after Conquer crashed it? Did it fall into the lava, leaving Conquer stuck? You could justify it by answering that one question, but the game never does that for us. The opponent is a Velociraptor, who conveniently has ropes around him. Hmm, looks like we're going to use it after we tame it. The Big Creep, yes I'm calling this sack of trash the Big Creep, sends the Raptor after Conquer, first by demonstrating his violent tendencies. When Conquer gets chewed, it triggers a cutscene where the creepy duo cheers the Raptor on. Why the Big Creep hates squirrels? You guessed it, is beyond anyone's comprehension. Conquer tames the reptile by wooing it with his locket and a context sensitive pad in the center of the arena. After some eating and interacting, this catches the Big Creep's attention, who sends in six fighters after Conquer kills innocent cavemen who just so happen to be in the arena for no reason. Are they on cleaning duty? The fighters taunt him in the same stupid way as the racers from before, before whacking the camera over as they prepare to fight, which I frankly liked. Oddly enough, when they knock Conquer out of his steed, it goes hostile and the troop retreats until Conquer tames the beast again. Like, can't they just, I don't know, fight Conquer alongside the Velociraptor? Sure, it would make the game harder, but at least it would make more sense from a narrative perspective. Well, who cares? This game doesn't care about having a story anyway, so... I do like this line, ranged combat, but there's something strange. There are three waves Conqueror must defeat, but all we get is the same pathetic pit fighters, and all six in count for each wave. Now if Seaver decided to make the second wave harder than the first, then why does the last wave combine both melee and ranged soldiers instead of sending in, I don't know, four elite fighters? In current form, this makes the third wave easier than the second one defeating the very purpose of enemy waves. Maybe this is because I played games like Star Defender when I was a kid, but I always expected enemy waves to get stronger and often more numerous over time. The ranged soldiers are definitely more powerful than the melee ones, so why not implement highly mobile melee and ranged soldiers with faster attack speed compared to the ranged soldiers? After killing a total of 18 soldiers, one of the most aggravating cutscenes in this game plays. The Big Creep implies that he has a deep rivalry for Conquer, which makes no sense because what did Conquer even do to deserve dying on stage? Not to mention this is the first time he ever showed up. Maybe the racers were acquainted to the Big Creep, who's likely their chief? But all Conquer did was just show up and trigger an event. How would the Big Creep know that Conquer killed all the racers if there weren't any survivors or witnesses? There's no motive to this game. The creepy woman claims that Conquer is cute, making a stupid joke that doesn't even make sense before taunting him for no reason, calling him Beast Boy. Naturally, this infuriates the massive moron who goes after Conquer to show him how big his bone really is, and we already know it's not the Bone Club. Interestingly, Seaver decides to change the subtext to suit this battle. While fighting the soldiers, the raptor would need to be tamed again after you got hit. But in the boss battle, the raptor would follow you if you took damage. It now wants you to ride it, and that's a nice touch, as it demonstrates character development in this game for the very first time, as the raptor is starting out viewing Conquer as its lunch, but over time, grows to see Conquer as its master. The boss battle itself, however, is terrible. The big creep 
voiced by Seaver himself, grates my ears when he talks, although I'll acknowledge the battle cries and grunts sound okay. The big creep will attack you by ground pounding for range, just like Donkey Kong 64's final confrontation with K. Rule, and will run up to attack you with his bone club in melee range, which is really a metaphor for the revolting raunchy result of defeating him, his so-called secret, the basis of his character. His gassy entrance shows that Seaver is trying to annoy you with this battle, and like the rest of the bosses so far, save for one okay fight, the big creep is nothing but horrendous jokes. When he winds up, you literally attack his... Then you damage him by biting his... Do it enough times, and... Seaver, why do you have to torment me with this whole boss? Oh well, now that there's a huge hole that leads to nowhere that hopefully the big creep dies in, Conker obsesses over the blonde freak of nature and bids the Velociraptor goodbye. The poor dinosaur is lured away while Conker gets what he really wants, the money and the creep. Now I actually feel really bad for the dinosaurs in this game. The baby dinosaur is literally murdered for no reason, while the Velociraptor was emotionally and psychologically manipulated. Notice that they both assisted Conker in his quest. So him treating them this badly after exploiting them only makes me hate Conquer even more than I already did. The next scene starring the babe time is disgusting and cringy as heck, where Conquer happily faints. This deformed giantess, whose voice is reminiscent of the similarly deformed sunflower, yeah Ridgeway has such a wide range, is better off looking like this. And she holds up her new hero, so to speak, calling him cute. Conker says he loves a creep, only to have her say something that makes no sense. She says she can't uh, love Conker anymore, which makes no sense because it's only there to close up the act without having anything meaningful happen between them. I know that Steve considers this an impossible feat given how ugly this model is, so why do this in the first place? The creepy crone has been chastising the big creep the whole time in favor of Conker, even taunting him to get him hulking to the arena, implying that they're not on the same terms, as the big creep hates squirrels for no reason, but this nitwit, whose name is literally a play on her horrendous character design, considers Conker cute and brave. So why turn him down like this? Beats me. Maybe she finally realized he's too small for her. Conker, who's just as confused as I am, admits he's a drunken retard and tries to tell her he has a negative reputation. She doesn't buy that because her expression doesn't change, and just puts him up the ledge where a pack of cash conveniently awaits. I got used to this a long time ago, but why would someone leave cash in a place like this? Then the creep contradicts herself AGAIN by saying she doesn't like saying goodbye, but then why is she saying goodbye? Surely she could spend some time with Conqueror, right? I know it's creepy for the previous reason mentioned, but it doesn't work in any way. We don't get to hear her thoughts on the big creep, we don't get to hear anything, it's just conquer cute, conquer bye. Then she contradicts herself yet again by saying she'll always love conquer, after saying she can't love him anymore, which already made no sense to begin with. I know she's trying to tell Conker that he's better off without her the whole time, but this writing is so bad it's confusing. It's not even funny, so it's just bad in every way. The creepy crone was the closest looking thing to a human female, and as a second of two giant female characters, both were made to look and sound as hot as possible. Even using the same voice and character design quirk, was the only difference being the creepy crone speaks in prehistoric gibberish. Worse is how this character never develops. She says she loves Conker, holds him up to call him cute, and this is goodbye while contradicting himself multiple times. We never see any real reason for her to like Conker. Heck, she doesn't even say anything celebratory while the big creep runs off in shame, so why taunt him to fight Conker, only to have her not show us her reaction to the big creep's defeat? This is stupid, unfunny, poorly written, and worst of all, a total waste of time. And we're finally done from this stupid world. <sighs> and it's night time. Conker's still sitting around unconscious. I'd love to kick him out, but knowing his cruelty, he'll most likely deceive me for playing his card. So I'm gonna let him stink up the living room and get back to reviewing his nightmarish game tomorrow. Oh, how am I going to sleep tonight with the way the last act ended?
We head back to the Queen Bee, who loses her hive again, crying about her husband not coming back to solve the issue. Gee, I wonder where he is right now. Conker bribes her into giving him four times the money from last time where she tells him the words It was a deep insurgency mission this time! Here's a problem though. How did the wasps, shown in this cutscene, steal the hive a second time? We've already established the queen is very protective of it, and she even uses it as a machine gun. So did they steal it in her sleep? Last I saw, night did not come around as this game is called Conker's Bad Fur Day. The whole game happens in one day, actually, too, but we're on the very first day. So how did the Queen Bee lose to the Wasps this time? Did she leave the hive only to come back and find it missing off-screen? Just give me a satisfying answer, Seaver. There's no way her machine gun hive was overpowered by the Wasps, even if they had great numbers. I was even going to ask if she ran out of ammo, but you guessed it, the next minigame shows it had infinite. Why are you taking my game so seriously, babe? Ah, uh, morning, Conker. I have a serious outlook because fans of this game genuinely call it a masterpiece of timeless humor, emotion, and storytelling. All your game does is mock my intelligence with its so-called infallible story. Whether you like the story or not, it's meant to be a fun adventure. Well, there's no motive behind it and you suck as a protagonist, so what is the game even trying to do? It's trying to make as many lovely jokes as possible. Just like how I use my special sober potion just this instant. You were sleeping in my armchair. Conqueror notices the wasps are idiots, who don't even ambush him until he enters and operates the beehive tank. Also, last I checked, wasps don't make honey like bees do, even if they pollinate flowers. Maybe these are just rival bees? Their hive looks a lot like that one in Click Lock Wood in Banjo-Kazooie, as well as in Banjo-Tooie's Cloud Cuckoo Land Beehive. As for the minigame itself, it looks pretty solid, especially the enemy radar. After you clear the minigame, Queen Bee comes in to say it's time to bring it back to Mini Hive from the same wasps she killed earlier. So Seaver, you're telling me that they just respawn just to do a harder version of carry back the hive just to kill them again? These same three nitwits? When a masterpiece, guys. I just sat there with a blank stare and felt nothing. There's a sentient barrel who sounds almost exactly like Birdie, who we roll down at the cost of money to unveil a new path sacrificing itself. We go down said new path at night. Yeah, I wonder what the Queen Bee is doing now that the entire wasp hive is destroyed by their very prize. We open a dark gate. And there is Greg again, angry at Catfish. I honestly feel bad for Greg, who's just doing his job. I'm just doing my job. I do what I'm told. I don't even get paid very much. It's charming, but it does underplay the prospect of him being a supernatural force. Yeah, that's right, being a slave to conquer. Greg claims he hates undead more than cats simply because they're harder to kill. In fact, Per Greg's instructions, only a headshot can kill the undead. But there's a contradiction. Greg, who's clearly a good guy as he literally brings Conker back to life, bends entirely to Conker's will, defeating the purpose of being a supernatural force. To contrive a reason for Conker to progress by changing his weapon from a useless frying pan to a shotgun, he has to hate the undead. Which, if you notice the problem, doesn't quite work because he himself is undead. Greg needs a better reason to hate the race most like him. And since Seaver can't come up with a good reason, perhaps I can. Before Greg became a Grim Reaper, he was a member of Count Batula's council. But they outcast him for having the idea of sorting through deaths instead of staying isolated within undead territory. Two. The undead, who often joke on Greg's job, at one point decided to unleash a feral cat onto him, biting his bones. Greg slashed that cat nine times, thus earning his hate for cats and undead. I could come up with more, but we can see that Greg's motive for hating the undead is quite petty considering he himself is undead. Also, notice how he says... One headshot, nothing more, nothing less, which implies that undead only have one life. That which can be taken away with firearms. Has he ever met his brethren in the game over dungeon? Oh well, it's more of a sad fate for who I still consider the best character in the game. 
We enter a mad monster mansion set piece where we must shoot some zombies before Greg intervenes to compliment you for presenting him with 12 souls. <coughs> like for real, Greg is pretty lovable. We enter a path littered with bony undead snakes. Yeah, I wonder if Seaver thought only zombies qualified as undead. Then Count Batula intervenes with arguably what I consider Seaver's best voice, along with Greg's, obviously. Please, enter of your own free will, and bring with you some of the happiness that is so evident in your face, and so lacking in my own. Now this is the part of the game that attempts to explain the conflict's backstory at large by bringing up an alliance between the Panthers and the Squirrels that has since been broken, for a reason that's never explained other than the war, like what caused the war to begin with. I do like this scene of Batula shouting at Conquer because he interrupted him, as he's quite proud of his history, which is admirable. Though how did Batula know Conquer's name if Conquer wasn't of normal birth? Well. Turns out that Conquer was Battle's great 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 grandson, and he turned Conquer into a bat off screen. Yeah, wasn't that when Battle drank Conquer's blood? Okay, stop. Look at Battle. He doesn't look anything like a squirrel, even though there's a portrait of a vampire squirrel. Now I know Battle is a vampire, as his name is based off Dracula, but why turn Conquer into a bat? Are all the squirrels in this game part bat, part squirrel? Like, I find it hard to believe that this thing is related to conquer by blood. But he's a vampire squirrel. Batula asks you to fetch the angry mob who are actually helpless villagers. And when you regain control of conquer, you can fly and... Defecate. Uh, why, Seaver? The game was coming off as too melodramatic and serious. So we had to implement defecating as a gameplay mechanic to lighten up the mood. I think he meant wrecking the mood. Again, it's the game's fault for wanting me to take its story seriously. It's genius writing. The story doesn't even make sense, you idiot. Ah well, have it your way. We stun the villagers with our messy mechanic and literally put them into a grinder. Batula eats grinded villagers marred with Conquer's own manure, as evidenced by this cutscene, of which there are multiple of, to show a gradual build-up to a joke Seaver decided to tell. Each progressive cutscene shows Batula gaining weight, thus causing the feeding rope he's dangling from to slowly whittle away. Without even seeing it, this was a very predictable joke of Batula falling to his death alluding to the explosive mouse from earlier. Batula is considered a boss by some, but that's really just busy work delivery, just like the mouse getting his cheese. On that note, let's explain why Batula can't be considered a boss, even when Profacia Gaming cited him as being one. For one, Conquer cannot take damage from Batula most of the time, mainly because Batula is just being friendly and sitting there, waiting for us to deliver his meals. It's very indirect and is nothing like the big creep and prior bosses who were actually trying to kill you. Heck, Batula doesn't even blame Conquer for his death, so I actually felt bad for the game forcing us to kill him to leave the mansion. Now in the context of Batula being a boss, the only thing confirming that is, yet again, having the whole charade be a retelling of a joke Seaver made earlier with a mouse bomb. I'll credit Seaver by acknowledging this retelling wasn't nearly as bad, as the only thing that came out of it was some cartoony gore. It wasn't funny since I saw it coming from many miles away, but it also wasn't offensive. When Batula got grinded, I was sitting there unfazed and thought, Hey wise guy, if you were alive and feeding on grinded animals wearing clothes for so many years, then why were you always positioned right atop the grinder itself? Also, the rope staying intact until now implies that he never ate more than two villagers a day, which is odd to say the least. Now, ignoring the implication that Conquer killed one of his old ancestors, his granddaddy no less, the spell wears off Conquer, waking up the zombies yet again. Personally, I find the zombies groaning voice lines nauseating. Don't ask why I brought this up. Escaping the mansion like nothing happened is simply using keys to unlock the big door. It's essentially yet another fetch quest. 
Each key lock opens a new part of the level, having us backtrack, yes, I never said this game has no backtracking, to areas of the level with access to the different keys whilst killing bats and zombies along the way in a tedious manner. Also, I know I should have mentioned this before, but the long jump ability is taken straight from Banjo Kazooie, only difference being Conquer doesn't have to learn it. Once we open the door, we find yet another sentient barrel who this time doesn't even bother to mutter a single word, letting Conquer run over the path infested with snake skeletons. At long last, we finally get a sense of world cohesion. The mansion's side exit leads us to where Birdie was at the start of the game. Once you go back to the hub world, yes, Conqueror's motive for being there is non-existent, a newspaper reading, The Midday Feral, announces war, with lesser news pertaining to King Bee's love triangle. You know, that one everyone forgot about, and the cavemen going extinct because of one unnamed culprit who we all know to be Conqueror, which is a much more interesting storyline than King Bee's love triangle. I like the music playing in that particular cutscene, as it's literally trying to parody big news announcements. However, it turns out it's not a news reporter, but literally the general himself trying to recruit soldiers. Why is the newspaper being presented by the general himself? There's no reporter starring him as its special guest in this news bulletin, so he is the reporter in this case. Maybe that's a joke, but it wasn't really funny. Thankfully, like Batula's death, it was mostly harmless. In this cutscene, the teddies are revealed to be marching, which is Seaver's attempt to remind you that this game has a story, hence why these small world-building moments are presented in such quick succession. The former about where the mansion led us shows how small the world really is, and the latter is a nonsensical way to build up one of the final acts. Throughout the entire game up to this point, we were literally wasting our time accomplishing nothing other than steal all the money in the tiny world that Conquer lives in. Where we went to before are just a bunch of levels and set pieces that are completely unrelated to the story just so Seaver can rush said story with the last sequence. So why have a story in the first place if so much of the time in this game is spent not developing as characters who are extremely flat and not building on the world itself? We pan back to Conquer, who conveniently heads over to a conveniently opened up new area marked with barbed wire for seemingly no reason. Did Conquer watch the call to arms and suddenly decide to join something he most likely wouldn't want to? Oh yeah, and about one of the first cutscenes, the one where Conquer tells Barry about fighting a war? How did he know a war was brewing even before the teddies were created? We're not given any answers to these questions, so I guess Conquer knows literally everything now. Entering the barbed wire wasteland, we trigger a cutscene with a sleeping squirrel inside a warplane. A submarine emerges from a body of water and shoots the plane bringing it right down in front of Conker, who appears terrified, maybe because he witnessed squirrels dying right in front of him. Sorry, Seaver, but hints of empathy towards squirrels, while understandable because it's the same species, need expanding given Conker's well-established cruelty, because a fearful face of empathy and active cruelty are very incongruent. Is it to put on an act to skew the public's thoughts of him? The general intervenes, making a mostly harmless, incompetent general joke. Hmm, maybe people like this game for its second half? It's not that bad, but there's still nothing to gravitate to. Whenever the game isn't trying to get on my nerves, it's usually boring. The general offers to conscript Conquer, who accepts without a word because the game's telling him to do so, even though the general is a swearing idiot who literally says he doesn't care about Conquer's uniform as well as giving Conquer his right to consent, or at least that's what he wants us to think of him. We then meet a TNT guy, who's just going to be used for an escort object puzzle, so it's worth noting that what happens if you lost a TNT guy. The first time you lose him, you can have him respawn at the restroom, I don't know why it chose restroom, and Concord notes that this is a different guy in a unique cutscene. Since Levin here messed up twice, Seaver decided to skip both cutscenes and just have it be a completely silent for third attempt and onward. This is reminiscent of Banjo Tui, where losing to a boss only to come back gets you a different cutscene with different dialogue, which is nice because it really sets the show up for a rematch for each boss. You did your homework, Seaver. Good job. After using the same ball-rolling animation on the TNT guy, whose voice is actually pretty good... Uh, hi, hi there, little fella. I... I... are you the janitor? 
once again, mm, good job, Seaver. Since TNT guy decides to stay put in a place where he would most likely be conveniently blown up later on. The general never objects to the thought of Conker attempting to blow someone up, but Conker somehow knows that he must turn the camp back on by way of killing electrical eels by luring them into the underwater rings, which is quite unconventional. I blow up the TNT guy by firecracking him. Firecracking? Is that even a word? I saw that coming, given how horribly sadistic you are. Yeah, remember that time I told him his barrel was something okay? He had no idea I was hoping to kill him. You're such a murderer. And there goes yet another innocent character who didn't get on my nerves. Baby Dinosaur, Batula, and now the TNT Gremlins. These three are harmless yet underdeveloped characters who die for literally no real reason other than to progress in the game. We blow up a second TNT Gremlin to tip the plane down from the ground, only to return to the General, who knocks Conker out, meaning that he was force conscripted the whole time. <laughs> Clever General. Turned out to be the one dude to dupe the duper. No wonder he got that rank. We pan to the boat the General brought up in his fake out dumb joke, where Conker wakes up wearing a helmet, surrounded by armed and vomiting gray squirrel soldiers. Why the vomiting? Eh, it felt kind of forced. The boat is headed straight into a shootout, as evident by the lead gray squirrel telling his comrades, It's been nice knowing you all. Later in the cutscene, it confirms the 30 seconds mentioned by the same said squirrel was the death countdown, as all the squirrels are massacred by the defending teddies. Channeling his inner Hideo Kojima, Seaver puts the camera in Conker's perspective, who witnesses soldiers dying underwater and on shore, as he swims to said shore with a horrified face, which suddenly turns into an optimistic one for some reason, before going back to pure fear with Empire Earth explosion sounds taking precedent over the mute, with a notable soldier picking up his lost right arm amidst the chaos. Hmm. The War Act is actually looking pretty solid. I still don't care about it since there's no real story going on, but I can see why people can enjoy it. Conker finally feels fear as he says, We assume control of Conker once again, where we this time need to avoid enemy fire and moving in a straight line with some barriers and janky machine gun hitboxes. We reach a survivor who repeats, not enough, because Conker was apparently the only soldier who was competent enough to survive the barrage, despite not receiving any training beforehand. The Grey Squirrel announces the threat to Conker as the Teddies, and Conker says he hates them to death for literally no reason. There's no motive for Conker being there, he just kills them because... Okay Conker, why do you hate the Teddies so much? They're bad guys. Maybe at least comment on the massacre? Feel pity for your dead brethren? Pointless. Life sucks anyway. You're conveniently the only one who survives just to fight the teddies alone, hogging all the spotlight. I don't think it's very good. That's compelling storytelling, baby. You tell me. You don't even have a reason for joining the war, not even reuniting with Barry. This time you're not even considering the possibility of dying, while also not thinking about how handsomely you'll be rewarded for being the solo carry god? Let's watch some more. Conker puts on a brave face after witnessing his last comrade's death, who Conker doesn't care about because we haven't had enough time with him. This next cutscene shows Conker upgrading his solo shotgun to a pair of assault rifles and stealing Grave's cigar for some reason. It's for a hardened soldier look. I think you meant a stereotypical one. We break the door and head into the Teddy's hideout triggering a suspenseful cutscene. Again, Seaver is quite the gifted screen player. I have no idea why he never made a screenplay again, given how many movie references keep coming out of those cutscenes. Then again, maybe I'm being too generous. Chances are Robin Beanland was too good of a support for Seaver's vision as he helped with the screenplay and writing. As the gameplay moveset improves, we get to play Call of Duty, 
Yes, I'm aware Rhea loves first-person shooters. Mulling down the teddies to get the door open. We get a typical security laser secret espionage act, where the teddies close in melee weapons initially. I like to briefly credit the security lasers being quite forgiving, as they disappear once you touch them, despite taking damage from doing so. I know that the war act isn't easy, but I always thought it was going to be an insta-kill. I find it funny how Seaver acknowledges the strength of ranged versus melee, as this game presents you with the latter for target practice to get used to the gunplay before presenting you ranged teddies who should be taken much more seriously, increasing the challenge aspect, as opposed to the prehistoric arena where the third wave of enemies was weaker than the second one. Conker then gets chased by these spider bots found at the base camp, which makes no sense because it implies that both sides train them, only the squirrels don't use them for anything really, and they are supposed to have an evil affinity, I have played Fire Emblem. After a gauntlet of teddy tossing, we reach a cutscene where Surgeon Teddies praise the game by wondering if 20 people could get this game's jokes before ending the unsurprisingly unfunny fourth wall joke by prompting to get back to being violent. So far, only a few jokes managed to stick the landing, those being Birdie's name from the start of the game and I'm Elephant, not Squirrel from halfway through. I think the main reason this game's jokes are so bland is because I personally don't find them funny since humor is very subjective. Again, I do appreciate Seaver cutting out the flatulence and inappropriate jokes, which would obviously bog down an entire act dedicated to war and espionage. After killing the surgeon teddies, we find a capture of the squirrel, who Conker electrocutes and leaves behind without saving him. Gee, I want to punch Conker in the face, because that literally proves that he has no motive to hate the teddies because he does not feel empathy for the squirrels, only pretending to apologize for electrocuting the one in the room. We enter a room with a teddy operating a machine gun tank, presumably the same ones deployed at the top of the building firing at the squirrel squadron at the start of the act. Approaching the murderous toy, we must hide behind metal blocks and climb a rope to gain access to a context-sensitive pad, enabling us to bazooka the teddy tubby, taking control of the machine gun tank triggering the same Gundam down minigame from inside the honey wasp hive. Massacring the teddies opens the door, leading into the about to murder a friend scene, this time with a heavily armored squirrel who is probably referencing a met from Mega Man. We kill the teddies and the captive recognizes Conker, who recognizes him back as Rodent, implying that they are friends. This brings out Conker's less evil side since he saved Rodent, who obviously decided to cooperate with him. One problem though, there's no motive for any of this stuff happening. Why is Rodent in this fight? Is it because the teddies were sent by the weasel professor to eradicate the squirrels because of his unbridled hate for them? Throughout the game, Conker was just wasting time and suddenly decided to fight a war that might have personal stakes for him. Only they're not really there because there was very little build up for said war. All we know is that Conker magically predicted a war at the start of the game as a weak form of foreshadowing. How he would know the evil professor would soon create two teddies to oppose the squirrels is beyond me. Perhaps one of the guys spied on the weasel dock and warned everyone about the potential war with the teddy tubbies. Only problem is, no such thing is shown or even mentioned. Continuing, Conquer claims there's bombers, of which we don't actually see, but we can tell are there because of their bombs. Bombs? Pressing on using Rodent as a shield. We eventually find a giant lock, which have four lights we must destroy in order to progress, all while being under Teddy Tubby fire. The next scene contradicts the very one we're in, as there are no teddies this time around. Funny enough, if you kill all the teddies in the previous room, we won't have to worry about the remnants chasing after Conquer and Rodent into the next room, where we find a class 22 tank that the latter is obsessed with. Now the shotgun thing shows that Conquer has had prior experience with firearms as weapons, so him using the assault rifles made some sense. But how the heck did Conquer learn how to operate a tank? Is Rodent the one operating the tank because he's so enamored by it? Busting the radioactive door, we enter a room guarded by bomb biters filled with radioactive waste, where at the end lies a switch which raises the radioactivity levels and opens the giant door near where the tank was located. 
Rodent moves the tank back to its location, and we head off to a gauntlet of raised metal bridges that Conker must fix with his context-sensitive anvil superpower, before blasting Teddy Tubbies in a building relying on caution sign color-coded fragments to bring about the next act, leaving Rodent and his favorite tank behind. Yeah, so much for being good friends. Conker falls into the pit and finds the submarine that destroyed the plane at the base camp. He encounters a crying little girl who wants her mummy, need I remind you, this game still uses the British voice cast in the North American version. Conker pretends to be nice, telling her that it's not safe for her to be around in a place so dangerous before she gives herself away by pointing to the sound as the inverse phase sonar. Conker immediately becomes suspicious of her, saying there's no way she learned something like that from school, let alone a missile with a very long name. Here's what's crazy though. Conker's characterization is very inconsistent. Sometimes he knows everything, including what to be dramatic irony, and other times he just falls through the traps of characters such as the general and this girl here. If he's suspicious of the girl, why did he go back on telling her to be careful? But I thought was just one submarine, turned out to be an entire army of them. They resemble that one from Banjo Tooie, yet more inspiration for a sub shootout. After destroying all of them, Conker announces his victory, which is the reason he seems to have wanted it all along from fighting this war, which he doesn't get on screen. Rodent intervenes and tells Conker not to pull the stuck unnamed girl out of the pit as she reveals her true form a puppet mounted on a monstrous robot Teddy Tubby. This all feels too familiar, as this act is simply parody after parody of intense action scenes but thankfully this time they feel more like tasteful references. I can't fault the scene of Rodent somehow recognizing the girl as a threat because most of the time story beats aren't very original anyway, although that's not a bad thing because they're exciting storytelling conventions that are key to narrative progression. Heck, I even got a comparison, that being the scene in Ace Attorney Investigations' Miles Edgeworth, where a friendly character steps out of the limelight to save the protagonist from a disguised threat. Now the year difference may raise some eyebrows, but this trope has been around for a long time, so the problem comes with how Conker only displays the trope to poke fun at it by not having it be truly important to the overarching narrative, just rather just a specific act. More on Conker's story structure later. The monster taunts Conker by asking him about his daughter, to which Conker responds no to with a horrified face. The irony here is that this act is trying to salvage Conker by making him a little more relatable. But we can only see how long this can keep up before Conker reverts to his evil side. Conker is still complacent to the deaths of his own fellow soldiers, never meaning to avenge them in any way. He just does things for money, and how he knew he would find such rewards by doing these things is never explained. He just does them for no reason other than the fact the story tells him to. Like it's all a game of luck. When we get around to fighting, the next scene shows that Conker really does know how to operate a tank, which makes no sense because he would have no knowledge of how the controls work, unless it's super simplified, which I doubt because tank cockpits possess a bevy of controls that only tank users fully understand. As for the boss battle itself, it's actually pretty good. An outlier, if you will. This one does reference a couple things like the other boss battles, but to a lesser extent as the Teddy Tubby's design is the most creative of the bosses we've encountered yet. Complete with the puppet, back tank loaded with robotic spiders, green fuel bag, and the many weapons at its disposal. The player tank's really well implemented in the gameplay. I've heard the controls are janky, but it's really cool to use. And the experiment has numerous phases the puppet calls lessons where the first one is a machine gun with quite a description. Tungsten? That's the first time I've ever heard that metal be used in a video game. As the experiment will defend his herald in battle, we must destroy the first phase's machine guns to lower the experiment's guard, rendering the puppet girl vulnerable. Shooting the puppet will blast her off the experiment's hand, leading the obese Oso to head straight to the puppet to pick her up, where you can target the spider tank, which is the weak point. This means that we have an actual boss battle this time around, rendering this fight as the clear winner. Yes, I'm saying this with the final boss in mind. Oddly enough, when you separate the girl from the experiment, a slightly modified version of the caveman death cry will play, meaning Sleever decided to lazily recycle an obviously unfitting voice clip, either because whoever voiced the puppet, supposedly Sleever himself, would have heard, 
either refused to make a new death cry, or he had to worry about Nintendo 64 memory cartridge limitations. Or maybe Seaver thought the sound effect was really funny. Remember, I'm covering mainly the N64 version. Phase 2 is a duet of laser cannons, and Phase 3 is a pair of highly explosive missile blasters. Each encounter appears harder than the last, which is proper difficulty progression, unlike the hordes of cavemen we consumed at the arena, where Wave 3 is easier than 2, which was harder than Wave 1. Now I can't tell for sure which weapons are the hardest to deal with, since they are about the same strength, but I do feel that Phase 3, which is that of the shrapnel shooters, looks particularly potent. Let me know how hard each phase actually is in the comments. It'd be fun to hear what you guys have to say about this game's only good boss battle. Once we defeat the Teddy Tubby, the puppet sends out the Spiderbots, her little babies, hidden inside the spider tank after Conquer. Here's what's ridiculous though. How did these spider robots get into the base camp with the good guys? Did this puppet Conquer set base camp when the general didn't complain about these spiders one bit? Like really, this isn't making any sense. That aside, the robots destroy Rodent's tank, quote, killing Rodent, unquote, where we get a very monotone grieving from Conquer, which implies he's actually happy that poor Rodent died, because he showed the boss who's boss. Said boss threatens that the charade isn't over yet, as she sets off a self-destruct button she just so happened to magically find. That, or it was with her the whole time. The entire facility is now under threat of blowing up, a direct reference to the Metroid series. Now, regarding the puppet herself, I actually think she's a decent character, just like Rodent, although he's entirely good while she's pure evil. They are both one-dimensional, but they're... they're pretty likable. Her main gimmick is swearing when she's aggravated, but you can easily control her emotions, which is more interesting than the other antagonists in this game. It's still one note, but it's a respectable effort. Throughout the battle, for example, she starts out super calm with the first phase, getting angrier each time her vessel takes damage. However, she remains composed throughout the entire fight and laughs maniacally when setting a self-destruct timer, almost looking like she's dying along with her voice since she has no vessel to carry her around. There's not much to her, but I do like the way her suspiciousness builds up before the boss battle. Her dialogue implies that she was at one point a little girl who was then turned into a horrible monster by, I'm assuming, Professor Weaselhack. I know, it's not his real name, but I'm skeptical of its true meaning. If only my narrative speculations receive some sort of confirmation. We head through a shortcut exit path that also takes us back to where we started, complete with security lasers and Teddy Tubby encounters as we painstakingly head back to the boat, which has a general on for some reason. Is this the same boat as before, or is this some other boat? Oh well, who cares? Is sent in conveniently to pick up Conquer, in lieu of his presence distracting the teddies. The general says there's another one, referring to Conquer. This line implies that the army was going to take off after waiting on picking up survivors for so long. Conquer mocks them as he orders them to pick them up, to which the general, who actually knows how to lead an army, orders his snipers to destroy the pursuing teddy tubbies. Before we continue, I'd like to harp on the squirrel general real quick, as I actually kinda like him. He's a big guy with a square face who pretends to be dumb but is actually smart enough to trick Conquer to thinking he'll be let off the hook when in reality he'll be forced conscripted. Along with Greg, he's the closest to actually being a character since he not only jokes around and deceives drunk red squirrels, but he also has a more likable side to him. Where Conquer pretends to hate war as he just tries to fit in, the general actually speaks with genuine passion and even feels pity for the dying soldiers. He's yet another highlight of the best part of the game, and that's stacking good things in this game's favor. I'm beginning to think that Seaver had tried to salvage his mistakes with this entire act, as there's generally less flaws throughout. Continuing on, the general sits by, waiting for Conker's cue, before making a forced swear joke and orders the men to pull the boat off Island Zebes. As Conker acknowledges his victory, we then pan over to Conquer waking up from a black screen where in said black screen he returned Graves' cigar before falling asleep. The General sees Conquer and calls him over to talk about how war is a bad thing, and how the Generals, including himself, are sitting back in a comfortable lounge while their soldiers die for a cause, which I praised about a minute ago. When I think about said cause more seriously, however, I realized that this far into the game, the Squirrels and the Teddies have no reason to be fighting each other. 
The Teddies are just evil for the sake of being evil, no real reason for why the Squirrels must fight them. Now, counter argument you may have is that the Weasel Professor wants to destroy the Squirrels, so he sends the Teddies after them. In which case, the Squirrels do have a good motive to declare war, that being to defend themselves from this new threat. Problem is, the Professor has no reason to destroy the Squirrels since he never had any bad blood with them and just hates them for no reason. Worse, as it's later revealed that the Teddies had been completely eradicated in the It's War Act, we never get to know the Professor's motives for creating them, or what goals would he achieve had they been used in his master plan, which I also think is severely underdeveloped. We then pan over to Ronan's corpse, which was never a corpse, as he contradicts being knocked out unconscious because he somehow remembered the self-destruct countdown. This implies that the writers don't understand dramatic irony, because the puppet threatened to bomb the island after Rodent was knocked out, so Rodent would have no idea the island is currently going to explode, unless maybe the puppet girl is dumb enough to make the countdown as loud as possible so that anyone can hear it, including the teddies, which would spark a panic among them which didn't happen because they all perish on the island as if caught by surprise. Oh, and Conqueror's fake grieving may also imply that he knew Rodent was alive the whole time. Pretty sure the fans can confirm that for me. Rodent tries to swear but is interrupted by the explosion that is visibly shown for spectacle, killing Teddies and blowing everything up. We pan back to Conqueror, who recognizes the voice of the fallen but not fallen hero, Rodent, who flew back right into the vessel. Conquer, who, one, never cared about Rodent in the first place, and two, potentially knew he wasn't dead, fakes a celebration over Rodent's survival as the tone of his voice sounds happily forced, in contrast with the squirrels who genuinely praise Rodent, or at least the tone sounds a little more genuine, but I could be wrong. As we make our landing, Conquer is shown on the last step of the big stairs. We get a black screen setting the passage of time, likely to skip what Seaver thought was boring thank yous from the general and remaining soldiers. Which is fair, nothing really wrong with that since this game's writing isn't as creative as most would tell you it is. It's like Seaver thought, you already knew Conquer was going to earn some appreciation so why not just skip it, marking the end of the US War Act, the best part of the game. Hey, let's ask Conquer something I may have forgotten to mention. Hey Conquer. Did you earn any money from the general as a reward for participating in the war? Hmm, not quite sure. Does this mean I had a reason to go shoot mutant teddy bears? In that case, I think you meant the unfortunate implication that the war act is entirely pointless, despite being the best part of the game. Actually, babe, I'd argue it's the worst part. It had almost no bad jokes to speak of. That's exactly why it was not bad, even though I wouldn't consider it particularly enjoyable outside of a gameplay perspective. Now I do like how the War Act simulates an infiltration into heavily guarded enemy territory as well as the prospect of a complete amateur fighter outperforming trained soldiers by a long shot, not to mention a Metroid style finish after defeating a boss that decided to care about being, you know, an actual boss battle instead of personifying pathetic vulgar jokes like these clowns did. That all aside though, it's time to venture into the last 30 or so minutes of this game. Once you get back to base camp, we find nobody in sight to interact with, so our only course of action is to leave the area, only to find some conveniently placed debris atop where the queen bee once stood, implying that the windmill fell on top of her while she was guarding her hive. I find it stupid that the War Axe newspaper brought up King Bee's love triangle only to never bring him back to see what he thought about his now dead wife. What even caused the windmill's destruction? Heck if anyone knows. All I know is that I don't care and that I just want this game to end. So what's the point of playing this game if you don't care about anything? Conquer climbs up to where the windmill in question once stood and makes a fourth wall joke which implies that we are about to enter the final level. Rodent shows up which implies that Conquer aborted the war boat last because remember this sometime later text. He tells Conquer more about his metal suit as Conquer pretends to cheer him on as a friend. Conquer then points out that the war is out so that Rodent can skedaddle, which very clearly shows, not to Rodent's knowledge, that Conquer is sick of him. Rodent, being an actual friend, compliments Conquer, saying he would always want them to work together in the future. 
which Conker pretends to appreciate. Rodent, being a real friend, walks off praising Conker after saluting him. Conker waits until Rodent disappears from the scene, before proceeding to call him an idiot because he didn't see through Conker's tricks. I'll give Seaver some credit, I honestly feel bad for Rodent, because despite being one-dimensionally friendly and cooperative, he is at least likable. And with that out of the way, it's time to get into some serious business. Proceeding into the broken windmill, we find a downward stairs leading into a tunnel. The tunnel takes us into a dark stone castle environment, where we meet Don Weasel, who says something utterly nonsensical for the first time despite his reserved and manipulative nature. He reminds Conker that he should have left town, which means what exactly? Is this hub world the town Riza was referring to? Why would he be more specific on that? Of course Conker wouldn't follow, since he knew nobody realized that he was the genocidal behind the prehistoric preschooler's demise. Riza regains his lost composure, realizes that Conker's cover is intact, and informs Conker that he's prepared him another job. Conker cries about wanting to go home, which may actually adhere to Weasel's out-of-town request from earlier since we have no idea where Conker or even Barry actually live. Weasel pursues the thought of having a little job, gives Conker the consent to accept or turn it down, and Conker decides to choose the former for some reason. Enter Barry in tight-fitting spy clothes, who of course cries about her outfit when she would rather wear shorts, before proceeding to notice Conker for the first time. Conker finally smiles, complimenting Barry's appearance mainly for her outfit. Weasel asks Barry to confirm the relationship, to which she does, without even being suspicious of Weasel, the very person who staged a kidnapping from earlier. Now before we continue, I'd like to note that the war act is indicative of last minute story progression, as the Teddy Tubbies were the main villains in that act, and since they are related to the evil professor who hasn't had screen time for quite a while now, we can see that Seaver was clearly hyping up the professor's plan by keeping us busy with a troop that's very obviously a threat. Don Weasel informs the duo of the plan at Conker's request, which was to replenish his funds at the Feral Reserve, a play on the USA Federal Reserve after getting into trouble by having Conker destroy the underground lava cave. So that act was ultimately story relevant to the whole time. Now this is a plot point that brings up numerous questions. If Weasel was put out of business, that means he took responsibility for Conker's evil doing. So why isn't Conker being punished in any way just because Weasel is the mastermind? Surely both would be punished, and they should, but as I said numerous times before, this world exists only to serve Conker's wishes. Who exactly punished Weasel for his wrongdoing? Some unnamed Nature Protection Administration? Also, if his crime, don't forget this, also Conker's crime, is committing genocide against a tribe of cavemen, what about the prehistoric preschoolers at the arena? If Weasel wanted to have all primitive preschoolers in the world go extinct, for a very pathetic reason, he clearly failed at doing that since the big creep's whereabouts are unknown, the creepy crone is all fine, and the arena has a larger number of primitives in the audience seats than all the preschoolers inside the lava cave itself. Like, this game wants me to take its story seriously, by connecting a mostly filler event to the main story, but it fails at explaining Weasel's motives or even showcasing his goals. Hey, I know it's been a while since I spoke, but you keep taking my game so seriously. You never stop. You keep regurgitating the same stuff but fail to see the problems I have with this game. You're better off drinking outside at this point. How about drinking inside? Hmm. You seem to know it better than even Barry does, so I've, I'll make sure to present you with a nice surprise should you resist me. I'm not resisting you, it's just... Oh, this isn't going to be pretty. Conker requests Weasel that he'll only cooperate if he wears a cool spy outfit so that he could finally work with his girlfriend for once, and Weasel accepts his sole condition. I'm assuming Conker hopes to steal all that's stashed in the bank, which is why he took the job. However, what is awkward is why Barry decided to do it. She doesn't seem to care about money nearly as much as Conker does, so I think she's only there because Seaver remembered to give her a tiny amount of screen time at the last minute. Conker slowly walks into the bank, putting his bag inside the testing conveyor belt before receiving security input from a guard. Once the bag is discovered to contain questionable material, Conker immediately massacres the guards like they were nothing, 
using the same dual assault rifles from the War Act. A last guard attempts to defend the bank entrance, but is dispatched by none other than Barry herself. I guess she wanted to murder someone for the fun of it? That or she's a robber baroness. The edge picks up as the camera pans to a ceiling view of the murderous duo before regaining control of Conquer, where we follow Barry to a security laser complex. Behind a pillar lies a context-sensitive light bulb, where it'll trigger a slowed down shootout against backup security guards, serving as the iconic Matrix reference we so desperately needed. It's definitely cool from a gameplay perspective, but here's the thing. Barry is just pacing back and forth, accomplishing nothing of value until we kill the guards. Where, as an aspiring acrobatic trainer, she jumps over the security lasers in an edgy fashion before revealing herself to be a professional hacker, turning off the lasers so that Conquer can proceed. Okay, I'm pretty sure that Don Weeza was teaching Barry how to hack into security systems off screen, so I guess Barry was with Weeza this whole time then. Not one complaint or skeptical thought even, implying she probably loves Weezo? This game makes no sense. This includes the next cutscene where after completing round 2, Conquer dodges each and every single bullet fired by this one security guard before Barry kills said guard by throwing a knife on him. So Conquer was a diversion and Barry was a surprise attack. Cool. What utter silent edginess amidst the loud and panicking security guards. Interestingly, the guards are able to destroy the walls Conquer will use for fire, meaning the faster you go in this minigame, the less likely you are to get hit. The third phase of this minigame ends with Conquer killing a security guard just by kicking him. And then after the final phase, we can see Barry jumping in the air, revealing a small white box in the upper left corner showcasing Barry's jump or something, I'm not sure what it's really there for. Maybe you could fill me in on that in the comment section. Barry brutally kicks the guard into the security lasers, destroying him and the laser complex, marking the third time she killed someone for spectacle. Entering the elevator, the Edge Lords find a room protected by a huge web of security lasers, only to have Barry completely shut them all off like a pro and open the safe in the process. Upon doing so, Conquer calls Barry one in a million. This implies that Conquer only loves Barry because her skills assist him in his money-grubbing greed, since that's what Barry's doing when she clears the path of obstacles. This transitions into his money-obsessed gaze, as he and Barry enter the safe. And here we encounter another example of poor writing. Barry calls Conquer a materialist, implying that she dislikes or even hates Conquer's obsession with money. If she was learning how to hack security systems and fight under Weasel's instructions, then why did she seem opposed to the prospect of robbing a bank? Like, why did she even bother doing it in the first place? Why take the off-screen lessons if she won't like putting her new skills to the test? Did she want to find meaning in her life? Did she just want to be a hacker all her life? Did she want to become a murderer? This doesn't make any sense! Conquer obsesses over the Grand and switches back to a frying pan, stunning them in order to grab them. Once Conquer claims three packs of dollars, Seaver uses a black screen transition to skip needless busy work, which is a good thing, bringing us to this moment. Conquer expressing great joy over having one million dollars in his possession, boasting about it to Barry, who obviously doesn't care. Again, why would she want to participate in a heist? if she doesn't even care about the reward for all the risks she's taking. She doesn't really seem to be doing this for Conquer either, because it's Conquer's behavior that needs to be addressed, but helping him do something she doesn't like him doing is incredibly contradictory and pointless. Anyway, she notifies Conquer about the surprise waiting above them this whole time. The Panther King, who after being absent for so long, celebrates Conquer being in the palm of his paws. Conquer who is finally confused for once, asks Barry who the heck this feline freak is, to which she's completely clueless about. Conqueror then recognizes the figure as the Panther King, who he only knew in stories told to him by his mother. The only surprise Conqueror's ever witnessed, after having known everything that happened so far where he shouldn't have, where all the money happened to be, how Greg and everyone else played into his game, and nearly everything else, except the general duping him, was that Conquer never expected the Panther King to be real. 
After a weak joke on fairy tales, things get interesting as Puma rewards Weasel with his bounty, who was most likely never put out of business to begin with, since there's no proof of it. Not to mention it was most likely a ploy to trick Conker into accepting his little job. Conker, who hoped to deceive Weasel himself, ended up being deceived himself, which is the climax of this narrative. Weasel asks the king what will happen to Conker, to which the king says he'll deal with the squirrel. Barry, who apparently pursues nothing but risk at this point, decides to step in to protect Conker, knowing he's in trouble. This is odd, considering their relationship isn't exactly mutualistic, so the sole purpose of this is to set up her shocking death. Pumo sees her as a threat, and requests Weasel to kill her, right in front of her lover. Weasel apologizes to her by calling her Dollface, implying that they were in love at one point. But now I'd like to talk about Barry and Conker in this instance. Weasel kills Barry by shooting her, which is pretty stupid considering what happened in this very act. If Barry were Barry, she would evade Weasel's shots like Conker did in the last minigame, jumping up to Weasel after realizing his betrayal and brutally kicking him into the wall to decimate him. It's like Seaver thought she can't be cool after her off-screen training, because he wanted the ending to be all tragic and sad for Conker, which means that this game does not have characters. It has characters playing to the story's demands, contradicting what we've seen earlier. Because Barry has acted cool on screen. Now, Weezo killing Barry is not inherently an issue, but the problem is she just walks up bravely, only to just stand there and do nothing like an idiot, not even attempting to put on a fight. Worse is Conker's reaction. Instead of stepping in to help Barry or push her out of the way or something like that, he just sits back and watches, not even reacting to Weezo pulling out a firearm. Also, if Barry had the weapon with her the whole time, why didn't she just shoot back at Weezo? You see why this game's story sucks now? Conker witnesses Barry breathing her last, laments her, before angrily looking up to Weezo, who reports to his boss, Pumo the Panther King, noticing that something is off. Pumo responds with an indigestion problem, before angrily calling the professor over to deal with the issue. The professor intervenes with his annoying voice, ignoring the king as he suffers, trying to order Conker be made into a table leg. The professor heads over to Conker, who is still confused, as is the king, who is suffocating while the professor reminisces on the war act, proving that it was story relevant, as expected, before the professor celebrates the incubation period's completion. Suddenly, it happens, as the king's chest explodes revealing a xenomorph in place of the teddy tubbies who Conker destroyed in the previous act. Professor Weaselhack, I can't get myself to say his name because it's probably yet another bad joke, boasts about his favorite creature as well as his technology, threatening to launch everyone into orbit with his fuel tanks, part liquid nitrogen, part oxygen, and two parts petrol. Don Weasel makes an exit, horrified at the death of his king, while Conker cries about never being able to return home, as the professor orders his ultimate weapon, Heinrich, to destroy Conker once and for all. But I lived in the end. Don't interrupt this, Conker. We're almost finished. Ah yes, here we are with the final boss battle, which begins with Conker pulling the lever that is now activated, opening the airlock hatch where initially the Panther King and his throne fly out into space. The strange thing is how Conker himself doesn't fly out despite the fact that he should, unless he is literally God, which frankly is pretty likely given how the game's been treating him this entire time. The lever also reveals a powerful suit, which is one of the professor's two fatal mistakes. Surely there would have to be a way to fight Heinrich, but Weasel Hack literally made this suit for no reason. It doesn't have anything to do with his plan, nor does it help it. If anything, it's the very thing that wins this game. So the professor not expressing dismay over his mistake is just ridiculous. Now chances are Weasel Hack may not have made the suit, but it is technologically advanced. So who's to say he didn't construct it? 
Now before we cover the final boss itself, I'll take a moment to rip through this brutal cyborg of an evil scientist. Professor Von Weaselhack is obviously the true villain of the game. As we already know, he hated the Panther King for no reason right from the beginning. He's pretty mediocre as a villain, since although he doesn't have any motives behind his actions or any backstory just like the Panther King, he is a conniving mastermind. He loves his evil creations, those being the Teddy Tubbies and Heinrich. His voice reeks of a forced German accent that sounds much worse than it has any right to be. He is manipulative, especially to the Panther King, pretending to be loyal to him when he was planning on killing him the whole time. In fact, the Panther King never once suspected anything of Weasel Hack even in his final moments. Now with these ingredients you have an interesting villain, but the one thing destroying Weasel Hack is his lack of motivation to destroy Conquer and conquer the world. Remember the spooky mansion act? That did nothing to explain his motive, nor did it provide any meaningful backstory to him. Remember what Puma said on duct tape earlier in the game? What even happened in that moment that helped to drive Weasel Hack to betraying his king? Now Weasel Hack does have a page on the Conquer wiki showing how he possibly came to be through the Milk Wars with the Panther King which could explain why he hates the king, but it's not too well explored. We can see that the Panther King took over the Weasel Kingdom, which is good, but there's no motivation for his evil actions, rendering it all meaningless. If you're going to implement lore, which a story-driven game like CBFD needs, you need to expand on that further, which Conquer's Bad Fur Day clearly doesn't. Alright, so let's finish this. Conquer shouts at Heinrich, who's immune to being sucked out like Conquer is, even without his suit. Did the vacuum get stronger or something? Also worth noting, if that did happen, why did Beery get sucked out after the Panther King and his throne? They're far heavier than she is, and there's still gravity in the spaceship. At least questionably. As for Weaselhack, the scheming mastermind finally realizes critical mistake number two. He forgot about the airlock, meaning that air will always be sucked out of the castle turned spaceship. So after Weasel Hack got himself killed by his own plan, the battle against his pet Heinrich finally begins. Heinrich will whack Conker with his tail, which Conker can avoid by jumping at the right time. Conker must punch Heinrich multiple times to stun it, where Conker can then grab it from his tail and swing it into the open airlock. This was Rare's answer to Super Mario 64, where both final bosses had to be swung into the damaging zone from their tails. And remember what I said about bosses in this game? They're usually trying to parody something or tell a joke. The Haybot was parodying a typical evil robot, although the boss battle was pretty solid. The big big guy and the big creep are raunchy jokes incarnate. The Great Mighty Garbage is a boss based entirely on toilet humor. The Teddy Tubby boss with the puppet girl is the outlier who still references numerous tropes. Just check out the TV tropes page for this game. I say the experiment is an outlier because it's not entirely a reference and it's the only fully fledged boss battle. And now the final boss is a Super Mario 64 Bowser parody without any music playing in the background. Although there is that annoying warning voice clip that plays when he sees Heinrich by its tail. Here is a subjective tier list I made of the bosses in Conquer's Bad Fur Day just for reference. Feel free to make your own. Conquer claims to have lost after tossing Heinrich into the airlock three times, which makes no sense, because Heinrich didn't really seem to gain an advantage, it just recuperated. Like I know it keeps creeping back in, making it feel like it's all hopeless. But when Heinrich jumps back at Conquer, something unbelievably nonsensical happens that being the game suddenly freezing, this is where the story, which was already terrible to begin with, breaks entirely. The only one who does not freeze is Conquer himself, whose eyes move briefly before breaking the fourth wall numerous times. Realizing that he's been gift wrapped a way out of this mess, he comes in contact with an unnamed developer by tapping the glass against the TV which completely sucks me out of the immersion. Conquer, literally having become god in his world, orders the final battle background's removal because it was too bleak and dark. Then orders a weapon reel, 
where he selects a katana as his weapon of choice, before finally teleporting himself and Heinrich back to the throne room. Now that Conquer can literally freeze and unfreeze time, this opens up huge problems with the story, which we'll get to once this is finally over. Conquer unfreezes time, making Heinrich fall to the ground. And at first, I thought this was going to be the final boss's second phase, but no. Conquer just slices Heinrich's head right off, and that's literally the end of it. Conquer has had his revenge, and seeing that he was in the throne room at the time, it's only natural to close the game off by opening the door and letting everyone in. Whew, time to break this final sequence down before I talk about why these past couple of minutes were so unbelievably bad. Frankie the Pitchfork congratulates Conquer on defeating the Panther King, which is unwarranted since Frankie was never hurt by Pumo to begin with. Not to mention that Professor Von Weaselhack was the one who killed the King in the first place, not Conquer. The Weasel Guards who were after Conquer at the Lava Cave also congratulate him somehow knowing his name, because they didn't like the Panther King ordering them around. I'm sorry, but again, Puma requesting milk is not enough to justify overthrowing him. You have to show him do cruel things to the weasel guards. Examples include throwing them into the dungeon or even putting them to death if they disobey. Puma roaring in anger doesn't strike me as a cruelty god. He threatens to use duct tape, but neither he nor the weasels ever go into any detail as to how it's a bad thing. Puma is just a harmless figurehead a fabled evil king of legend who doesn't do anything except shock the player with his death. Speaking of gods, Conqueror laments how he forgot to bring Barry back to life in that instance where the game froze. He tries calling the programmer but there's no response, which means either the story or the programmer wanted the superpower to only be used once, which only complicates matters, leaving many, many questions that will never be answered. Imagine being so badly written that you must rely on something like breaking the game with the help of game developers to complete the narrative. In this case, the devs represent the gods, who decided to freeze the game for no reason whatsoever, because I find it very hard to believe that the game would suddenly just crash like that, out of nowhere. In addition, if Conquer doesn't deserve to have Barry back, then why freeze everything except Conquer in that instance? If Conquer called the shots to unfreeze the game to finish off Heinrich, does this mean the programmers must adhere to Conquer's bidding and have no free will of their own? If Conquer contacted Robin Beedland to compose a new song for the Lava Cave Act, which was something I really liked by the way, why would he treat the game crash like it was the first time he ever manipulated the developers? Why would they later turn their backs on Conquer once he calls them back? Is tapping the TV glass the only way to contact them, which he forgot to do in the throne room? Can the programmers only hear him if the game is frozen, where he's literally the only one immune to a code crash? If Conqueror knew that the programmers could do anything, and if the programmers only show up to respond if the game crashed, does that mean Conqueror could potentially exploit another crash to bring Barry back? These questions, and many more I'm sure, have yet to be answered, Especially since this event was so important to the story, yet the game's already over, meaning this will just be hand-waved, leaving the player frustrated where we need all the answers at this point. So ultimately speaking, there's no tension to this game. How can fans overlook such a huge issue? This just sucks me out of the immersion because it feels so out of place, especially since the fourth wall jokes from before were pretty acceptable as they were just nice distractions. But this is taking it too far, by literally turning them into plot devices. I believe that Seaver chose the laziest twist, making the entire world appear like a typical adult cartoon world at the start, only to have us realize that the entire thing was a game undergoing development the whole time. It might have made for an interesting joke back in the day, but I think it was a really bad thing to use as a twist because they're mixing it all with something that's supposed to be taken seriously, that being Barry's death. And I can't take this twist seriously, because it's not compelling storytelling. We spent all this time going random places to experience random events and unfunny jokes without any build-up for the story-intensive moment, or even any subtle hints for that matter, throughout the adventure. 
Siva realized that he couldn't come up with a creative way to send the spaceship crashing back into the throne room, so he decided to warp everybody there by the power of the developers, who only had me asking questions that will never be answered. Then you might object and tell me that this is a very creative move. That turning the game about from a random Frista Cat world into self-awareness incarnate was very unexpected and over the top. But let's just say that I'm not the biggest fan of subverting expectations if the decision leaves me feeling confused, annoyed, and unsatisfied. You may tell me that confusion is the point, as it makes the game spontaneous, but no matter what you may like about this ending, I don't find it compelling, funny, or even interesting in any way. It just feels like a cop-out way to end the game. Implementing world-breaking mechanics that will never be revisited and explored, because this game never got the sequel that was initially planned for development, as it was cancelled. Yes, we'll get back to that. There was a much anticipated sequel. For now, let's keep going. Marvin the Mouse Bomb intervenes all patched up, defying the laws of life as his explosion should have resulted in his death. Also, who put him back together again if not himself? Also, how and why did he get here of all places? The cogs from the factory arc returned because they somehow knew there was a coronation. Heck, all of these characters magically knew Conquer was here and honestly have no reason to celebrate his unannounced coronation. Weren't these two weasels at the lava area for one? How did they get back? Who ordered them to return? Rodent, the only one alongside maybe Frankie who would be glad to celebrate Conquer's coronation, also shows up to celebrate which triggers Conker's angry rant about being with a bunch of people he doesn't like, implying the one he hates the most is poor Rodent, who offers to be his general. After everybody chants, Long live the king, Conker goes into his final monologue. Let's hear it, so that I can tell you what I think. So, there I am. King. King of all the land. And who'd have thought that? <laughs> Not me. I guess you know who these guys are now. Cause I certainly do. I don't want to know them. And yep, I may be king. I have all the money in the world. And all the land. And all that stuff. But you know, I don't really think I want it. I just want to go home, with Barry, and, I don't know, have a bottle of beer. Hmm. It's not gonna happen. It's true what they say. The grass is always greener. And you don't really know what it is you have until it's gone. 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 Now, as you may already know, Conquer fans revere this game for its theme regarding how Conquer has everything in the world, including all the money and all the land, not to mention how he's king, but lost only one thing that matters to him more than everything else that being his girlfriend, Barry. The fact that he could get her back because he forgot to utilize his god-given superpower to reprogram the game however he saw fit was what drove him into eternal sadness, which was expected given his greed. He succumbed to his greed, chasing after material gain, losing what truly mattered to him, which is easily the most unfortunate thing that happens to Conquer thus far. Which I would agree with if Conquer's Bad Fur Day actually gave us a reason to care about Barry. In addition to that, Conquer fans, Conquer doesn't care much about being with Barry at all. So this ending is trying to emotionally manipulate you into caring about two characters who are not only unlikable, but also do not have a well-written relationship, as there was little to no build-up to Barry's death. I'll provide you with every single reason why Conquer crying about losing Barry is stupid given this game's wishy-washy writing. At the start of the game, 
Conker tells Barry he will return late after fighting a war with an unspecified enemy, where Barry doesn't respond even though she knows Conker is calling her. Is she just pushing Conker out of any conversation he wants to have with her? Honestly, I can't see any reason for Conker to even love her, since she's just so aloof, always trying to do her own things independently. That's all there is to Barry, really. She's a very bland character who has no in-universe reason to hate Conker other than maybe his obsession with money and alcohol. She doesn't even say anything much about his drinking or lusting habits. She doesn't even complain about how cruel and manipulative he is. We might know what she really thinks about Conker if and only if she got more screen time, which we already know she didn't. When she was being kidnapped by that golem, she just angrily whined about Conker having some bad excuses, which really means that Conker probably does make bad excuses to hurt her feelings despite showing nothing but pure love towards her in-game. I wish Barry would elaborate on said excuses, even later in the game after you reunite with her, but no, the game can only hint. It wouldn't even give you an example. The closest I can think of is Conker lying about buying groceries when he really meant spending that money at the bar to get hung over, but that's just speculation which the game never outright confirms for you. It essentially means that Barry's just whining about things without any context. Heck, you could even use some kind of diary or note for post-game content or something. The abusive relationship between Conker and Barry is self-contradicting, despite the fact it's clearly there. Since Conker loves Barry, and never once complained about her shouting or nagging at him. Yes, he did complain about her not noticing him when she ran off to Don Weezo outside the disco, but he instantly blamed the saber-tooth helmet instead of realizing that Barry was the one who didn't even recognize his voice when he called out to her. Yes, that somehow warrants emotional feelings from players, literally overlooking the fact that Barry should know Conker very well by now. That is unless they were dating just recently, where I think they would be on better terms given how relationships go most of the time. Like, you see how I'm saying things that probably aren't even true? Even if she couldn't see his face due to his relative height to hers, she would recognize him from his voice. She also doesn't say anything, which I pointed out earlier. When Conker tried telling Barry that it's really him, Barry saw his face but felt the need to pretend to be dumb and call him a caveman. I'm sorry, but Barry is supposed to be intelligent. There is no way you can make the excuse that she's dumb in this instance. Now Barry's wiki page states that this was probably done so as not to show her loyalty and honesty to Conquer in front of Weezo, which would get her killed. Now this does imply that Barry does care about Conquer deep down, which is fine. I just wish they had more chemistry on screen, the wiki even admits that by the way. It also implies she's suspicious of Weezo until after he taught her all that crazy stuff, when she didn't even express shock over his betrayal, which is thoughtless writing at best. I also pointed out that Barry spends most of the game off screen practicing and mastering the art of a Matrix spy, which isn't too bad in itself, it's just that there's no motive behind it, as explained previously. I'm going in chronological order here, but she literally only appears in four areas two of which are standalone cutscenes. Now I know this game is very linear, but the writers could have easily had Barry whined about Conker's bad excuses in more detail without needing post-game content or easter eggs. They had quite a few opportunities to do that, but they missed out on each one. Barry gets little screen time, but almost none of the dialogue she ever spits out is meaningful. You can easily rectify that by just having her point out Conker's wrongdoings, which should have been done repeatedly when they cooperate for the first and only time. The best they did is to have her express annoyance over Conqueror's materialism, but that's about it. As it stands, the game makes Barry look needlessly privileged and mad at Conquer for no reason. We already know that Conquer is evil, but Barry not only relishes in doing evil acts herself such as robbing a bank without a reward while also killing weasel security guards in gratuitous ways. But she never outright directly nags at Conquer on screen. They never argue about the relationship, making the prospect of an abusive one theoretical at best, and removes relatability from either character. So here's how I would fix this. In the base game, there are only two cutscenes and two in-game interactions for Barry. 
So without adding much screen time for her, here's what I would rewrite. The opening cutscene does an okay job of setting up the abusive relationship, because Barry can ignore someone she wouldn't like, so it can stay intact. However, in the second cutscene, Barry would hear someone knocking at the door, complain about Conker's excuses, like normal, but actually show us a few examples, namely the ones that bothered her the most. Say on one of their date nights, Conker promised Barry that he would never hang out with another girl. But then he passes by another pretty female squirrel named Marcy and asks if he can hang out with her, leaving Barry alone so he can simp for Marcy, breaking his promise in so doing. That, as well as the previous example I brought up, are good enough instances of bad excuses Barry can bring up to actually make you feel sorry for her. And then she can get kidnapped by the golem as normal. Where you see her dancing in a disco, after you free her, she doesn't have to say anything. All you have to do is briefly pan to her looking at him angrily, so that you can empathize with her even more. And when you get to Don Weasel's place, Barry would not just call Conker a simple caveman. Rather, she would say something harsher, like a primitive love hopper. Although she could still tell Weasel that she doesn't know who Conker is, just to dismay Conker even more because Conker would know that Barry's still mad at him for ditching her back there. I know this whole Marcy bit is made up, but it at least makes it a little more compelling, right? Now for the final act, the one that only had these two joint forces so that Barry could have her shocking death. I already pointed out the problems with her death and how to fix them, so let's finish cleaning up this mess. Barry's entrance is fine, in front of Weasel nothing really needs to change there, because Barry wouldn't really want to slander her boyfriend right in front of her employer, even if she knew Conker would deserve it. Remember, Barry doesn't have to be entirely evil so that you can sympathize with her. However, remember what I said about the Matrix reference being there solely to prevent Barry from saying important things? I'd rather have them talk to each other about their problems and what they should improve to get along better like the conversations I wrote on screen, before having security guards interrupt them. These conversations will humanize the duo, even explaining Barry's reason to join Conker, thus making the ending actually hit as hard as fans claim it does because now you actually care for Barry and Conker. Now in the base game, the writers left out as many details as possible so that you won't feel for Barry when she dies, defeating the purpose of an emotional death. This is stupid considering how they contrived the story with Barry's rushed and contradictory death. Not to mention Conker's lament over failing to abuse a superpower to bring her back, before finishing it all off with Conker's sad monologue and depressing credits theme. Just to trick you into thinking that, oh, this really is very sad. With this rewrite, Barry still acts largely the same, only difference is, she actually has a motive this time around. I'm not going to rewrite the entire game, since that would warrant a whole other video if I ever got around to doing that. Last thing I want to mention, whether it be at the base game, or the rewrite I came up with for Barry, please remove her from the box art. We don't want to be misled, because we already know Barry gets no screen time. And so that takes care of Barry, leaving us to deal with this insufferable imp. I'm not exactly sure if I had covered him as a character in depth. And I'm also not quite sure why I left him for last either, despite being the main protagonist. Regardless, Conker is an aggravating anti-hero of sorts, who's designed to be as unrelatable as possible to anyone except maybe alcoholics? Frankly, he might be relatable to the mentally challenged, including criminals. So in other words, he's a criminal who gets away doing practically anything he wants. He is a murderous, unlikable, forgettable, poorly written, cruel, and annoying alcohol addict, and I really have nothing else to say about him aside his occasional accurate remarks as a minor plus. And he's also the super saiyan who takes advantage of the developers. We know he lost Barry, and he treats her death like it's the biggest deal ever, like she was the most important thing to him even though neither of them have any meaningful interactions with each other as previously explained. It's worth pointing out that Conker does seem to care about Barry, which is why he tells her that he will be late in the beginning of the game. He magically figures that she gets kidnapped, which makes no sense, 
But when he finally gets to hear her voice for the first time, he doesn't apologize. He just says, Hey. Hey, Barry, it's me. Expecting her to actually care for him. He never laments his past mistakes resulting in Barry losing respect for him, implying that he may only love her because he's exploiting her, which contradicts his feelings of genuine love at the end of the game. Maybe he's trying to redeem himself, is how I like to interpret this contradiction, but the game shows no effort to show Conker apologizing to his girlfriend for all his bad excuses and alcohol addiction. He's never optimistic around her, like he doesn't explain the prospect that they could live to be the king and queen of all the land, if they owned all the money in the world. Neither he nor Barry even try rekindling a lost relationship, which means that Conker's true love for Barry is nonsensical. This leaves me asking, why does Conker love Barry if all she does is shut him out? So sure, players would definitely relate to the idea of Conker spending all the time hunting after all the money in the world, for which his motive is never explained, mind you, only to realize that money is not the most important thing out there, it's people who are special to you. Now I do agree that this is a good message. But the problem here is that the fans claim it's the most emotional ending of all time, almost like it's the biggest highlight of their favorite game which they enjoyed for all the bad jokes and movie references. The main thing people use to justify this ending and why it's so good is because it subverted expectations by feeling so out of left field compared to the rest of the game with how deep, dark, and emotional it all felt compared to the light-hearted, jokey nature we've been used to this whole time. It catches everyone off guard and I can see what Seaver was going for here. The only problem is... With all that we spoke about just a few minutes ago, we have no reason to care for Barry or even Conker because the relationship is very underdeveloped. Conker spent the entire game sneering over his moolah, but when he moaned about losing Barry, I felt nothing. Alright, let's wrap up this review with a post credits cutscene. We find a depressed Conker alone at a bar was the bartender taking Conker's order of scotch spirits with no ice. The bartender, who resembles the general but sounds like a deeper version of Birdie, asks Conker what's wrong. Conker, who seems to have lost his evilness because he lost Barry, refuses to answer because it's too depressing, before walking out to the right instead of the left like he did in the beginning. And this is how Conker's bad fur day ends. Thank god, this game's finally over. There really isn't much to like about this game. Heck, Levin even gave his thoughts on the game and... Uh, let's just say I agree with him. I don't even know where to go after this review. Perhaps I can count on... Hmm... Hmm... You told my game to shreds with that review. Ah, Conker! It's been so long since you spoke. I forgot you were even here. I know I've been harsh towards your game, but it has legitimate problems that even the remake couldn't really fix. Then what about Live and Reloaded? Ah! You can put down the scowl now. You just gave me an idea. How about I talk about the things I liked about Conker's Bad Fur Day, then talk about the 2005 remake, and finally, how a sequel could potentially benefit your main outing. In that case, don't displease me. You made fun of Barry, hence why I'm watching your every move. Oh. Mm. Okay, I said there's not much to like about this game, but there are pluses. For one, the multiplayer mode looks like a lot of fun. Even though I'm not sure how the controls would have felt because I never really played this game. Now I actually like the story mode acts that are more self-aware, taking themselves less seriously such as the lava cave act, not counting the baby dinosaur's murder of course, and the spooky mansion act. The problem is how Conqueror's Bad Fur Day can't decide whether it wants to have a serious and dark narrative, or be a whimsical adventure. Ahem! Oh! Oh, oh sorry Conquer. We covered most, if not all, the characters, of which I only like a few, 
I decided to use a tier list and infographic to display everything I think about the characters, notable and minor. I obviously like the war act as well as its respective boss, but since I discussed the entire act at length, all that leaves are my thoughts on the soundtrack and the voice acting. The OST is pretty weak, with most of the songs that's coming across as boring to me. I don't like the song that plays on the mountain of muck, that's for sure, but the songs I do like are Conquer the King Reprise, which is the credits song, Ole, the heist minigame theme, and the prehistoric preschoolers. You know, that one that Conquer requested Bean to play? I feel that the credits theme is underrated, as it is so depressing that it was the only semblance of sadness in that scene, at least to me. Most fans still think it's the wonky writing that carried the emotion, but this song really helps, whether you feel the writing is strong or not. Ole is a bullfighting parody song that brightens me up, while Heist is a catchy high action theme that is over 3 minutes long and is the best song in the game hands down, which is fitting since the multiplayer does seem to be the best part of the game. The theme of the primitive pit fighters is just really relaxing and fun to listen to. Sadly, that's all there is to the soundtrack in terms of good. I really wanted to like Slopperano, because the premise of a single pile of muck was unique. I like the instrumental version, but I just didn't like the lyrics, which is a double-edged sword since Chris Marlowe has the best voice in Conqueror's Bad Fur Day hands down, as his impression of this thing was just really funny to listen to, until he kept swearing and spouting toilet jokes down my ear canals every few seconds. I'll just replay his defeat quote because that was quite the marvel. Ah, you cursed squirrel, look what you've done! What a world, what a world! Who'd have thought a good little squirrel like you could destroy my beautiful flagginess? Oh, I'm going! Oh! Ah! No! Ah! <laughs> now that's what I call a bowel movement. Aside Marlowe's character, everybody else has voice quality ranging from good to outright bad. Here's another tier list infographic, for the voices this time. Everyone says that Conqueror's Bad Fur Day has the most talented voice actors, those being Seaver and Ridgeway, praised mainly for their voice ranges. As a college male with a wide range of voices myself, I do find the voice range of both actors to be a plus, but the voice acting and line delivery itself is a little problematic. The voice acting sounds improvised, and that's because they're unscripted. This makes it hard to understand what the heck the characters are even saying most of the time due to their awkward line delivery. Thankfully, the text boxes remedy this weakness. A good example of amateur line delivery would be when Conquer says, Conquer the King. Conquer is clearly manipulative and intelligent when he's not drunk, as evidenced by how he talks people into giving him money. Conquer is a perfect character, as he's the only one who knows about Rare's developers, as opposed to the rest of the cast. It is true he forgets to resurrect Barry, but that doesn't mean he's dumb enough to have that awkward pause. It's like Seaver, the voice of Conquer, thought about Conquer's occupation for a moment before remembering that he's a king. Now the pause could also be explained by Conquer not wanting to consider himself a king since he was opposed to his own coronation, but the pause is in the game nevertheless. Another example of poor line delivery was in the part where Conquer realizes that he could have revived Barry. When he begs the programmers to return, he doesn't sound desperate, he just sounds unironically excited with a slightly sad undertone. Oh, programmer. Oh, thank God. Also, and I hope this is the last time I'll say this, multiple characters sound very similar to Birdie, one of the first characters to show up in the entire game. I also made fun of these uncanny ulcers for having the exact same voice. I had to watch the cutscenes back to back just to hear how everybody sounded like in the making of this tier list infographic, and obviously my issues with the voice acting are mostly subjective as I feel many of the characters don't have too much variety or even much personality. Like the Panther King doesn't sound too angry or even evil, for example. But maybe it's just me. It's a respectable effort for sure, but the voice acting isn't perfect. 
Where fans praise the spontaneity and the way how amateurish most of the lines are delivered, I think it's passable at best. Some of Seaver's bad voices include Carl the Cog, Marvin the Mouse Bomb, the Haystacks, the King Bee, Professor Weaselhack, the freaking protagonist himself. In fact, it would seem to me that these give me just what I need at that moment in time. And especially the big creep. However, I will praise Seaver's impressions of Don Weasel, the little girl, the tall weasel guard, Greg, and Batula especially. Is that really what you think? Some of it sounds too good to be true. Yes, I'm really being honest here. Speaking of honest thoughts, I think Conquer Live and Reloaded improved a few things from its N64 counterpart, but kept pretty much the entire game intact, only adding to it, which is fine I guess, but it doesn't fix most of the writing problems. In that regard, the biggest credit I will give Live and Reloaded is giving Professor Weaselhack a much needed backstory, which the N64 version didn't have. Remember, I am mainly focusing on the Nintendo 64 version, which is why I didn't bring up the remake too much and I'm only focusing on it now. Yes, I know, there really is a lot here. According to the Conquer Wiki, Weaselhack lost his legs to a war, and the fact this picture exists proves that this war is indeed canon, which is good because it develops a character who so desperately needed it. That's not to say the new plot material is without flaws, though, since it has not been confirmed that the Panther King was the one responsible for decapitating Weasel Hack's legs, rendering the Big Bad's motive for killing the figurehead ambiguous. So we only got some okay backstory, and that's the best Conquer Live and Reloaded did. Okay, on to other things. Live and Reloaded improved the multiplayer, at least that's according to some testimonies I didn't have the original Xbox growing up, the controls were fixed making the overall gameplay more tolerable. Along with a slew of quality of life changes, that's about it for pluses. They added a few more boring songs to the already weak soundtrack. They generally made the game fuzzier, but in so doing, they also made the game uglier. Yes, I think the Xbox version looks uglier than the N64 version, despite the fact textures were improved throughout. Although the female characters had their visuals improved, such as Barry and even this abomination, everybody else looks creepier to a degree, not to mention unappealing to look at in some places. Take this game over scene from Conquer's Bad Fur Day, and now compare it to Live Reloaded. Ugh, I know Conquer looks more terrified than the latter, but he's scaring me more than anything else presented in this game. Conquer himself, in general, looks very creepy in this remake. I mean, just look at him. They increased Barry's vulgarity for no reason, added enemies to attempt to make the game more engaging, and heavily increased the detail to blood, violence, and gore, which should mean that this game is even more adult as N64 version, right? Well, it turns out that the reason fans tend to prefer the original is because this version has more censorship, despite the fact it was published by Microsoft instead of Nintendo. Yes, this was in the post-rare Nintendo era, Hence why we got this remake that focused more on the new Xbox multiplayer system, called Xbox Live & Co, instead of Conquer's other bad day, which we'll get to in a few. Rare initially wanted to release the remake as Conquer Live & Uncut, a completely uncensored version of the original, but Microsoft warned them that if it were fully uncensored, the game would become a manhunt too, making it impossible to sell copies in retail stores. Rare was puzzled by this decision, but as a second-party developer who still work for Microsoft even to this day with 2016's Sea of Thieves, they had no choice but to comply to Microsoft's demands. Now I'm probably going to anger pretty much every Conquer fan out there, but I think Microsoft's decision was justified, even intelligent from a business perspective. Like the game didn't even sell that well even with the retail advantage. Personally, I find it pretty stupid that people are willing to overlook whatever improvements this game presented, including filling up plot holes which I think is the biggest improvement, just to criticize Live and Reloaded for censorship. Like this is the thing people bring up when talking about the remake, that it was bad because it was censored even more than the original. 
People even add to this argument by comparing Microsoft, the very company to feature the adult franchise Halo on their Xbox system, to Nintendo, who are well known for their family consoles. Like, yeah, it is pretty funny, but what isn't funny is the prospect of seeing grotesque things that even the original had the decency to hide. For example, having these two clowns on screen at the same time. I can't imagine how much worse live and uncut would have been compared to Bad Fur Day, and the fact that people want that kinda disgusts me. Overall, and the censorship is not the main reason why I believe this, Live and Reloaded is somewhat superior to the original, despite being around the same low quality. You disappoint me again! Pro censorship? If you don't have anything good to say about the sequel, then I promise Barry I'll blow you up! Uh, nice uniform, but I... Okay, can you please put that gun down? So, Conqueror's Other Bad Day, a much-anticipated sequel set to be released on the GameCube that fans happen to blame Live and Reloaded for not existing. Personally, instead of blaming Live and Reloaded, I find it's very obvious that Microsoft was a culprit here, as they saw no interest in the Conquer franchise. Oddly enough, they were able to predict that Live and Reloaded would not sell, so their low expectations had matched. So unfortunately, Conquer is officially an indie series at this point given the series' low sales, even Pocket Tales, which is the best game in the series for obvious reasons. While I look at Young Conquer, I ask myself, what the heck is this thing? It looks so goofy and creepy. But I'm going off topic, this is about Conquer's other bad day. So, the game was rumored to be a continuation, where Seaver himself hinted at the return of Barry as the main twist villain attempting to reference the Terminator, where Barry would be called the Barrynator. Of course, that was just a design concept. But before I tell you what I think, let's go over some other things. Conker, who was the king of all the land in the last game, was now in the dungeon with Birdie. That was another concept that needed more time to make sense, but it's a cool starting point. The Panther King was also set to return after Live and Reload that made him into Han Solo for some reason in that game's new content, but yeah, essentially Barry and Pumo are coming back to life in the next game, with the former being the main antagonist. Now, there's a lot of potential for these ideas to work, although the Terminator reference isn't really fitting for the final boss, even though it's better than Heinrich, who was forced to be a Bowser ripoff. Now, a lot of questions will pop up regarding these ideas. How exactly will Barry and Pumo be revived? Will the developers revive them for testing purposes? Will the developers finally get their plot holes filled in a satisfying way? Will Conker redeem himself and move past just being a completely unlikable person after realizing it was his fault that Barry died? Like heck, in Bad Fur Day, he just stood there and watched her die. He didn't even try saving her. If Barry is going to return as the main villain, will she be killed by her lover? Or will she be redeemed in the end? Will Barry prove to be a more competent threat than Pumo in the sequel? If Pumo is essentially a Dumber Ludo Avarius from Star vs. the Forces of Evil, will he actually develop into a dangerous opponent? Will he return to take back his kingdom and punish the traitors for wronging him? Will Don Rizzo rejoin Pumo after having escaped the spaceship, scheming to overthrow Conquer? Like some fan theorists say that Rizzo was sucked into space, but I find that unlikely since he disappeared before the ship took off. Like, he really could have been another villain in the grand sequel. It's just that, there's a lot of potential. We could finally get some cutscenes showing flashbacks of Conker and Barry being together, including good and bad moments to develop their relationship. This is very important. It was something the first game should have at least attempted. But in this game, where Barry is the villain, we as the audience will see how she's fallen from an honest and respectable young woman. We could see her motivations for turning evil after all that time being a good character. Maybe it's just me, but I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. If she dies at the hands of Conker, Conker will cry over having killed his girlfriend, and the flashbacks would show both Barry and Conker as morally grey, meaning we can sympathize with and relate to them. There are many ways as to how the game could end. 
1. Barry would change her mind once Conqueror apologizes for his neglectful and cruel behavior and apologize to him herself for only making things worse for them. Then they would return to the throne room, where the ending would be a happy one as opposed to bad fur days, but also end on a bittersweet note, with Barry and Conqueror promising to better themselves as people and as a couple, becoming the king and queen of all the land. Ending number 2, Barry refuses to forgive Conker and dies in his arms once again, except that Conker had no choice but to kill her, crying in her face. I would personally leave the sad ending there, but we can't just retcon the developers, who Conker will pray for in this ending. Suddenly, the game will pause, and he will talk to the developers, where they could agree to rewind the game for a new DLC story where Conker will try to fix where he wronged Barry, revive Barry yet again, or even just tell Conker the entire story without doing anything, in a choose your ending scenario. Really, just think of the possibilities. There are so many ways a sequel to Conker's Bad Fur Day would work. It would be a more serious game with a greater narrative focus and heavily improved gameplay. And with less bad jokes, this will only be a plus. If the team actually cared about fixing Bad Fur Day's shortcomings in the sequel, we would have a reverse Last of Us 2, because the sequel will actually surpass the original, like what Rare did in its prime. I know that Other Bad Day would be the biggest blessing Conquer fans could ever get, and if it does all the things I suggested and it answers all the questions the previous game failed to answer, even if it still must be M-rated, I would really like this game, provided it doesn't force itself to be too crass like Bad Fur Day and especially live and uncut. But we can only dream, as the prospect of Conker's other Bad Day being released anytime soon is unlikely. As it stands right now, the series has been long dead since Live and Reloaded, with weird things like Young Conker giving companies less incentive to care about the squirrel. Out of every game out there, Conker's Bad Fur Day for as bad as it is, is definitely a game most deserving of a sequel. That, I'm sure you'll finally agree with, Conker fans. And I'm sure Conker will agree too. <gasps> what the? What the? What the? Conker, I was only saying good things about- Cut that garbage out! I told you I heard you call it bad for a day bad again. I declare you my target to avenge Barry with! Wait, you did say that. You just wanted me to have more positive outlook on things, didn't you? Uh, it's not Fire Emblem Fates bad. Did I hear the word bad? You Wait a minute. Is this is how many jokes the characters trash. No, I'm just pointing out the character flawed. Now die! Stupid reload! Only a few seconds before he reloads to murder me, and he's barring the path to my wardrobe where my tome and staff are, so I can't fight back. Is this really the end? No way I now, traitorous babe. I'll have my cathartic moment. Oh, is it really the general again? Seaver? Is that really you? Yes, it is I, madam. <gasps> Thanks for saving me. No worries. You called me over yesterday and I felt no need to wait. Since game development has been going quite slowly, so my short departure won't mean much. So tell me, you wanted to interview me for that one game I was known for. Yes, that's exactly right, sir. I wanted to hear what you think of the Conquer series. How do you feel about Conquer's Bad Fur Day? I had a good time with Conquer, but over time I started losing touch with Bad Fur Day. There were things that I regret adding, most egregiously the scene with the sunflower and the bee king. Yeah, that was pretty horrendous. And that was just Bad Fur Day. Just imagine if Live and Uncut was a reality. 
Were you really the one who called the shots before Microsoft objected and you decided to respond was live and reloaded? I was, yes. But looking back, I honestly don't really mind what happened. I never really cared for the industry. I just wanted to pursue my own vision. So seeing how you moved on from Conqueror, has your vision changed? I mean, you did kill this ravenous rodent. I guess you could say that, even though fans hailed me for being the mastermind behind his game, as well as being his voice actor. I don't really care for him anymore, as my tastes have evolved into something more palatable. You could say I underwent a process called character growth. Which Bad Fur Day pretty much lacks indefinitely. I never really thought I'd see the cycle of regret coming from you, the very one to pitch these ideas. It shocked quite a few, but the Conqueror Spirit still lives inside me, albeit more purely, as I intend to create Bad Fur Day's spiritual successor. Hmm, a spiritual successor to Conqueror's Bad Fur Day from Going Instinct. That's a good idea. However, I feel that Bad Fur Day is the kind of game that needed a sequel given how many plot holes it has for something that takes itself so seriously. What do you think of Conqueror's other Bad Day? Before we get there, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was made as a comedic adventure with a deep and melodramatic twist at the very end. Naturally, you did seem to have massive issues with that, but I think it has never been tried before. Which is why Bad Fur Day is so revered even today. It really did warrant a sequel with how it ended. About the sequel itself though, it could have been interesting, since that game had a better defined story than the original. I mapped everything out, hoping to keep everything truly special a surprise, while the major premises I did reveal would get people hooked. Now I could have easily created other bad day after leaving Rare, but I simply lost motivation to do it. Because again, I lost much of the conquer spirit, even though I do like celebrating my past achievements. So you're saying that the conquer series is dead, hence the corpse in your hand? Not necessarily, but I, along with everyone else, I'm not thrilled with where they're taking Conker. The latest entry, Young Conker, is a game that everyone likes to make fun of, and we don't need to beat a dead horse if you catch my breath. All attempts to bring Conker back to relevance have proven futile, save for their replay, which is literally a port of multiple games, not just Conker's iconic outing. So I'm convinced. Even if fans may resonate with me for being the voice actor of their favorite character, I just grew out of this series. I hope this is the last time I regurgitate what my fans perceive as the unutterable statement, since I know many of them are watching even as we speak, and I don't want to disappoint them. <laughs> you just had to end this with a fourth wall break. It's a good one though, so how do you like to close off this conversation? I think I got pretty much every question out of my system. Well, there's a corpse to deal with. Better not incinerate him, as there'd be a fire hazard. Can't bury him either, he's too undignified. Harsh as it may seem, I'd like to see him get eaten by botflies. Obviously, I don't hate Conker, but he literally tried killing you in blind rage, so I had to step in. I still owe you something for that save. Perhaps we can sit back and reminisce as a way to close off this video before we eat scones for dinner off screen? I'd be happy to do that. I heavily appreciate the offer. And at last, we've come to the end of this very long video. Where fans would consider it timeless, I believe that Conker's Bad Fur Day was a product of his time, that was made to be an exception to what was expected of Rare at the time and people loved it for doing just that. Conqueror's Bad Fur Day was the last thing people expected Rare to release, especially because it is literally in a cartoon aesthetic. But the fact it exists at all is truly astonishing given the impressive history of the company behind this overrated mess of a video game. Many times I look back and think, 
I can't believe it exists. Because it's just so... unexpected. Spontaneous in its concept, jokes, visual style, screenplay, and even poor narrative structure with that shocking ending. But in a way, what I'm doing here is very similar to what Rare did back in 2001. Think about it. Conquest Bad Fur Day was one adults-only, cartoony 3D platformer amongst the many family-friendly cartoony 3D platformers. Yes, that includes the even worse Bubsy 3D that is literally unplayable. When you see someone review CBFD, you expect a very positive review, but mine is one mostly negative review akin to the many positive reviews out there. It is strange, isn't it? Then again, I could sense that something was wrong when I first heard that Verde was an adult cartoon game made by Rare. I hoped for the game to at least be somewhat enjoyable, but unfortunately my expectations came out on top. Part of me always wanted to see why this game was so beloved. And then it hit me. Conquest Bad Fur Day is a typical adult cartoon made into a game. It's a comedy, first and foremost, one that holds up very well today according to most fans. Humor is a very subjective thing, and as I was saying throughout this entire review, I didn't find the jokes funny where everyone else most likely did. This was why there was such a large variety of jokes, even though most of them were either uninteresting, grotesque, unfunny, predictable, or even pretentious. It's to appeal to everyone who just wants to laugh along with the game, and in a way, I can commend that. There's no other game I can think of that focuses entirely on humor, even masterpieces like the Ace Attorney series, which utilizes humor far better. Most adult games were either just raunchy without a creative or interesting edge, or were too dark and gritty focusing on nothing except violence, violence, and more violence. Sometimes you would mix the two together, but Conquer doesn't only do that, it also adds a cartoony charm to it, most egregiously, Rare's googly-eyed non-living objects. I'm not saying all adult games are bad, far from it. I really love games like Bioshock Infinite, Assassin's Creed 4, and even Your Turn to Die to name an indie example, because they actually pique my interest with explosive gameplay, likable characters, and interesting narratives. I'll reiterate, I wanted Conquest Bad Fur Day to be good, but it just ended up annoying me with all it did. Aside the many pop culture references and dated movie parodies, the game has a broken narrative that everybody praises as one of the many great things found in a game focused mostly on humor, distracted by how the game subverted their expectations so that they couldn't see the critical narrative flaws at play. It went both ways being completely nonsensical while also trying to make me take it seriously. The characters are mostly bad or mediocre with only a few outliers, who aren't even that good. The writing is horrible, and so are the jokes. I could go on, but then everyone will tell me that, at the end of the day, Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is a game, therefore you can't judge it fairly without having played it for yourself. Well, what if I told you that Conquer fans themselves see issues with the level designs? The clunkiness of some mechanics, context sensitivity being the answer to a limited moveset, and poor control on a controller known for hand bleeding. If the fans admit to the gameplay is flawed, then why should I assume that I would find the gameplay fun if the superficial aspects, level design problems, and limited moveset would hold it back for me? Like I said before, Live and Reloaded improved the controls, but it doesn't fix the level design, as the game was updated rather than reworked. And worst of all, a sequel that had the potential, I'm not saying it would be perfect, it could still be bad, to make up for this game's many shortcomings was destroyed thanks to the death of Rare, and likewise the Conquer series, at the hands of Microsoft. Now I promised Mr. Seaver that reminiscing is a proper way to end this video. At the end of the day, I will always praise and respect Rare for creating games that I grew up with, those being the Bender Kazooie duology, as I said long before. Along with the other non-Rare games that I played on my old N64 that has since died out, I fell in love with 2D and 3D platformers because of Rare specifically. They also created the Donkey Kong Country SNES trilogy, which are all amazing in their own right, not even just the second game, which is still the best. 
Diddy Kong Racing, Donkey Kong 64, and Star Fox Adventures, aka Dinosaur Planet while in development, will always have some reverence, even if people still have issues with the latter two. I voiced a frog and rabbit to that last one. <laughs> Good times, Rare. You were stellar there, Sir Seaver. It's like a complete 180 from your own game released just a year prior. It's for your passion why I respect you and your work as a developer. Thank you. You should also note the other noteworthy games that I had a hand in. You said games for adults weren't inherently bad, right? I suggest you play Perfect Dark and Killer Instinct. <laughs> oh, sorry Sir Seaver, but this isn't a rare ad. Although sure, I'd be interested in checking out those games sometime soon. Uh, you're packing your bag? We only just finished supper. Sadly, I have to go back now. I must prepare myself for the next game that's most likely coming out in the next four years. However, I'd be interested in revisiting your studio sometime soon. And maybe we can have a little talk. Social media is much easier. Even if I think Conqueror's Bad Fur Day wasn't a good game, it at least taught me that popular culture references aren't entirely a bad thing. I wished you could stay for longer, but I understand your decision. It was nice having met you, Sir Saver. As it was for you, madam. Goodbye. Goodbye. Ah, so you're still here? Thank you so much for watching this video all the way to the end. I know it won't be well received by the public, and that's fine. I can take criticism, especially knowing that I focus more on the story, characters, and subtext more than the actual gameplay. However, on that note, I would request to keep it civil in the comments section. I warn those who are angry at me for making this video. If you all berate or shout at me, or even type an entire essay explaining why Conqueror's Bad Fur Day is an infallible masterpiece without listening to my side of the story and then calling me the Panther Queen or something negative in the comment section, this just proves that the Conqueror fandom is incapable of taking a different opinion. I understand that people really love this game, and I'm not trying to ruin their enjoyment of it. I'm just explaining why I personally don't like it. I said that again because you may have forgotten that I said it at the start of the video as a disclaimer. Remember I said all this, with Super Flipper 76's pain in mind, so let this be a lesson to you. With all that said, if you enjoyed this video, or hated it, I would really appreciate your feedback, as I read every comment, no matter how negative. This was a daring and difficult project. So I'd like to know how I can improve my videos over time, and make them more palatable to viewers. Thanks again for watching until the end. Ciao!